Hello everyone, this is Thersites the Historian. I'm here with Sean Chick. Welcome back. It is Sunday night. You know what that means? We're going to discuss some shit. Tonight, we're talking about accessible history and nonfiction books. And once again, I'd like to thank the Patreon supporter who provided me with this idea earlier in the week. We were really struggling to come up with an idea. And luckily, that idea really fit the bill for what we wanted to do this week. So... We're going to be recommending books. I think we both divided it a little bit based on topic. And I guess I will first lay out the general outline of the kinds of books I will present. So I don't know if I've ever talked about this, but the way I always organize my books, both ebooks on my computer and also the books that I have at my house, I have three categories of books Greek, Roman, and other. Um, and other includes literally everything. I have a whole stack of political books and a lot of other various histories, but that's how I always think of books, Greek, Roman, and other. And I guess fiction, <laughs> you could call it another category too, but we're not going into fiction tonight. Um, so I will be reading from those categories. I also happened to see a comment earlier this evening that somebody left on this video asking about ancient science, so I decided to try to put together a list of the science of you know a few accessible science books that have been written about the ancient world, uh, with the caution that these books are not quite as accessible as some of the other ones that I've already put on to this list. So, Sean, do you want to explain sort of the outline of what you'll be presenting? Yeah, I'm just going to do a, a series of books uh, with uh, American history in mind, or so, or events that involved America, because that really is more or less my specialty. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I'm just going to be doing. I got about, I don't know, like, uh, five or six on the list here tonight. Okay. All yeah. right. Oh, uh, did you, uh, did you want to, uh, talk about anything political at the end or, um, um, I guess if people ask or if the conversation okay. veers that way, we can do that, I guess. Gotcha. Oh, I did, I did also want to say that if anybody has a question about anything in particular, like looking for some kind of book recommendation, you know. Feel free to leave a super chat. We'll definitely, I'll definitely answer what I can at the time. Of course, you, you as well. You know. Yeah, but anyway, just don't ask uh, about so, the Austro-Hungarian Empire because uh, or the Thirty Years' War. Yeah. So there, there's <laughs> those two topics are off the map because we don't have an answer. Um, just so you know, we don't want you to waste your money or whatever. Um, also, <laughs> if any of you are aspiring to be best-selling popular historians, I highly recommend becoming the person who writes the first readable and accessible account for the general historical audience on the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Because I've found a few, and those things are really, really rough. So unless you are really dedicated to the topic and you're in a grad seminar, there's no way you're going to get through some of these. It's a very it's a very complicated uh, it's a very complicated topic because they had the polyglot empire. Yeah. Uh, another one I've run into trouble with is anytime I've tried to tackle the Russian Revolution, I just start getting a headache. Uh, yes, there's a lot of moving parts involved, for sure. Yeah, uh, it's crazy, because the French Revolution has a lot of moving parts, and it can get a little confusing, but I find that one's a lot more digestible than the Russian. Well, I think it's because France is not quite as geographically massive, and there's also just a general division between Paris and then the rest of France. So there are some limits to the complexity. Whereas in Russia, I, I mean, like the battle lines are absolutely insane not to mention the number of factions the number of players I also think the political ideologies in the russian revolve the russian Re russian revolution are so diverse right i mean i'm not saying they're not diverse with the french one but there's there's just there's there's a lot more common ground uh between a lot of the groups there but i'm you the russian revolution you have i mean you got your anarchists you've got your communists the Mensheviks, uh you have like actions within the white movement of course for when you find the russian civil war because you know some whites want to bring the czar back some don't you know it's all over the place and some want to become the khan of mongolia i mean you've got all kinds of different people out there. <laughs> yeah um, there we go <laughs> yeah so i mean and that that's like i feel like that one is best treated as a side story the unger and sternberg stuff because i feel like there's a lot of mental illness that goes into that one uh more so than any particular cause Oh, it, it's a sideshow for sure. I mean, it's an interesting, crazy story, but he's, I mean, he's on the fringe of the empire and, you know, when they, when they put their resources into feeding him, he gets crushed fairly quickly. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. 
So, um, I guess I can start with a few of my recommendations, and then I'll turn it over to you. You can make a few, and we'll just go back and forth until we get through our stuff. So, right. the first list I have here are books on ancient Greece. And although this is my specialty subject, the thing that I know the most about, now that I think about it, a lot of the books that I'm aware of on classical Greece are either monographs or they are not necessarily a good starting place for a general reader or they maybe are geared towards a very specific audience rather than a more general audience with a more general interest in the topic. So what I've tried to do is find things that should be of interest to just sort of a general history fan who happens to have some interest in antiquity. And I find that it was harder to find the ones for Greece than Rome, even though I know the books about Greece far better. I guess there's, you know, there are more Roman history fans uh, in the general population, so that probably accounts for that. So anyhow, um, the first book I have on here covers especially Archaic Greece and the Rise of the Polis. That is Michael Grant's The Rise of the Greeks. Now we'll pull that up real fast so you can take a look at it. Uh, Michael Grant was a very successful popular historian who was mostly active in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And all of his books are pretty good, but in my personal opinion, The Rise of the Greeks was the best one. The issues that he brings up about the rise of the polis are very complicated, and obviously what he said in the 1970s on the popular level is very outdated now, Nonetheless, a lot of it isn't necessarily wrong. So this won't give you up-to-date scholarship by any stretch of the imagination, but it will introduce a lot of the basic problems, and it will also give you a good idea of the scope of Greek civilization in the early years. So, very good book. Let's see, another one we can cover early on here. Um, well, I guess we can just talk about Sparta real fast. So... In general, most books on Sparta are not very easy to read, surprisingly, except for the ones that are specifically written uh, to appeal to audiences who are big fans of 300, but a lot of those have very little academic weight. But the guy on Sparta by a mile is Paul Cartledge, and in recent years he's gone into um, a lot of other fields, but... All right, here it is. His real specialty and the thing that put him on the map was ancient Sparta. He wrote his dissertation on the topic, and I think from about 1968 until the early 2000s, that's pretty much all he ever wrote about. So he is the guy to go to for this topic. He knows all of the social classes, and he can explain this very clearly. And by the time you get to his more popular efforts as he's trying to move away from Sparta and move into Athens, democracy, and other issues that have interested him. Uh, he writes his most accessible works, but he still has the academic vigor that he put into the earlier works. So although these are popular press books and they're easy to access, the academic quality of books such as the one on the screen are very good. And in many ways, if you wanted to write a paper on Sparta, for instance, and you were intimidated by how dense some of his earlier works were, one thing you could do is read these books to get all of his ideas, and then when you go back and look at the old books, everything is much, much easier to understand. That's what I ended up doing when I was an undergrad. So, Paul Cartledge, um, The Spartans, I think that this is a very solid book if you want to get a general idea of what's going on in Sparta, and especially if you want to try to gain some appreciation of the institutions of Sparta. So there's that. And now I'll go through the ones on Athens. Now, I had to resist the temptation to make an entire list just about Athens because that is very much what I do, and I'm really into this history. The first book that I recommend is called The Bad Citizen in Classical Athens by Matthew Christ. And... This is a very accessible book, very easily readable. However, this one is cited in pretty much every work on Athens that's written for just scholars. Because Matthew R. Christ is a very serious scholar, 
And in this book, he puts forward an idea that he'd been working on for a little while by this point, that a lot of the elites of Athens were basically dragging their feet, that they were not very enthusiastic supporters of democracy, that they weren't really pulling their weight if they could get away with it. And since the publication of this book, I think that most people are accepting of his ideas. The works I've seen in the last couple of years, so especially 2018 to the present, have pretty much all very much internalized the idea that many of the elites dragged their feet and tried to do the minimum, except for the ones who wanted to attain office, of course. Um, the other good thing about this book, not only is it very thorough, very scholarly, um, it goes through a lot of institutional details that you would almost never get in a popular history. It also is still one that you could read and then go talk to somebody who actually studies Greece for a living and know exactly what they're talking about and be on the level. So this book is very, very good. And I've actually seen it cheaper than what you see here. So just look around for it, eBay, whatever. Definitely worth your time. Uh, let's see, we got this one out of the way. Another one that is also very good and which I think you can probably get for a better price than what's about to pop up is called Athenian Democracy at War by David Pritchard, who mostly wrote about sports until he wrote this book in 2018. It's interesting. Yeah, and this book, well, he, he wrote about sport as kind of a preparation for war. So he's kind of tending this direction anyway and talking about how these aristocratic athletes fit into a democratic society. In this one, what he tries to do is very ambitious. He really tries to explain the Athenian war machine as a whole, which is something okay. that no one had done before. And there are some problems with this book. In my dissertation, there are a lot of things that I disagree with uh, that came out of this book, for instance. That being said, this is the only book that I'm aware of which systematically lays out the Athenian military apparatus. And at 24 bucks on Kindle, or what, 29-ish on pa in paperback, that's actually a pretty damn good deal. So if you're interested in how the Athenians went to war, then this would be the best one place to look. And again, this book has this book is new, so it's actually on the cutting edge of this field. So you actually could read this, then go talk to some ancient expert, and you might just blow them away with your knowledge, because most people in academia study some fairly narrow topics. And if they're not up to date on, say, warfare, then you could talk about this book and make them think that you are some sort of uh, scholarly god, I guess. Um, so there's that. Another one about Athenian culture, more broadly, that is interesting to look at. And a little bit more fun, I guess you could say, because it's about vice, and who doesn't love a little bit of vice? It's called Courtesans and Fish Cakes. Huh. So basically it's about aristocratic waste and this is by James Davidson so yeah as the thing says sex shopping and fish madness Athenian style so this is basically about <laughs> the lifestyles of the rich and famous how people like to waste money show off their status and it gathers evidence from a lot of text which talk about banquets and some of those gatherings Socrates would be at where he would debate philosophy Basically, if you want to learn what they were actually eating and what the entertainment was like while Socrates and some other guy are debating ethics in the corner, what everybody else is doing for fun, then read this book. Um, pretty solid. You can find this at a lot of used bookstores because it's been out for a while. I think I picked up my copy for maybe three or four bucks out of a used bookstore one time. So, uh, good buy and fairly fun. I had fun reading this one. Um, another one before we get into the Peloponnesian War, um, I don't know if it's necessarily the best one stop for the Persian War. However, I do remember this book being particularly good and Barry Strauss is another guy who is a legitimate scholar, but also is extremely accessible as a writer. So his book on the Battle of Salamis is a very good one. And unlike a lot of people, he actually does seem to have some grasp of naval warfare. So that's always a plus. 
And in general, if you see a book by Barry Strauss, not a bad pickup. What were you going to say? A quick question. You mentioned that he actually has a grasp of naval warfare. Uh, I mean, you, are you trying to tell me a lot of books on naval warfare, at least ancient naval warfare, are very poor? Um, yeah. I've encountered a lot which aren't very informative. So there are basically three types of books on ancient Athenian naval warfare. One type are the ones which are very general and broad and go through the institution uh, and its effect on Athens. Another mm -hmm. type just look at the ships themselves and are very technical. Um, some of those are interesting, but ultimately it doesn't have much perspective. So unless you're really into gear and gadgets, it's probably not a very useful investment. I had to get into it because of uh, it was you know part of my dissertation looking at what triarchs do. But um, yeah. that stuff can get a little painful, at least to me. And the other one is to look at the institutions of the Navy itself. Um, how did people afford to keep these warships at sea? What was the cost sharing between the triarchs and the state? What were the shipyards like? And those, are those unfortunately, are all very scholarly and very difficult to access and really do anything with. So I don't recommend any of those. Also, they'd be very expensive. But okay. um, this one gives you a general idea if, uh, if you would be interested or not in naval warfare. I believe he describes things like the Diekplus and Paraplus and some of the maneuvers that they did, but I don't know for sure if he goes into that. It's been a long time since I read this book, but I do remember it being quite good. Unfortunately, this was at my dad's house, and I'm pretty sure he tossed a lot of mulled books, so this one is probably um. in a landfill somewhere right now. Um, oh, one last one before I turn it over to you while we're on the topic of naval warfare. Another book on the subject, which is very general, so this is very much what you call a dad history, so give it to somebody who just wants a really superficial knowledge and a little bit of imagination, but not really any engagement. Lords of the Sea, the epic story of the Athenian Navy and the birth of democracy by John R. Hale. When I first read this, I was really impressed, but now that I know a lot more about the Athenian Navy, not so much, because he doesn't go into any of the institutional stuff at all. It's just, hey, this was the Athenian Navy, and here's kind of how they kicked ass in the 5th century, and again, a little bit in the 4th century. Um, that being said, if you don't know anything about the subject and you just want a primer, so that way you you just want to satisfy that curiosity a touch, or you want a very easy entry point, this book would be good for that. But if you're looking for depth, I would recommend um, moving on from this one rather quickly. So those are my initial okay. batch, and I'll uh, let you make some picks. All right. Uh, for this one, I'll talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about some books having to do with the American Revolution. I will not be discussing the colonial period because I have not yet run into an accessible book about colonial America. Uh, colonial American books. Uh, I'm not saying they're bad necessarily, but they do tend to be rather, um, rather dry. I don't want to say technical, but it's. It's like they want to get to the nuance of every single policy. And the fact that we just don't have quite as many sources, I feel like a lot of colonial books, you get a lot of speculation and odd theories. You know, like like some of the weirdest theories I've run into in American uh, uh, history, I've run into in colonial books. Um, one of them was the, the idea that there was a, uh, the first American Revolution happened in the 1600s with Governor Andros, it's the, the rebellion against him. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it, but it's kind of just a cute opinion, right? Or you have uh, American Slavery, American Freedom by Morgan, Edmund S. Morgan, and it's an interesting argument, but it was it's just, it's, it's, it's just not a really well-written book. You know, I, I just I thought it was a drag. Uh, now, Morgan's argument, by the way, was that the only reason we have a concept of American freedom is because of slavery. His argument being that um, slavery gave the planter class of Virginia the leisure time to think up these political theories and ideals that would then be applied in the revolution. And it also gave them an idea that if you lose liberty, you can be a slave because they see what it's like to not have liberty every day of their lives. Uh, what was the name of the book again? 
was a American freedom, American slavery, or American slave, American freedom. I can't remember which words were first. Uh, it's American uh, I'm actually not, okay, I'm actually not recommending the book. It's not particularly well written. Uh, several arguments in the book have actually been demolished over the years. The, but I will say this. The thesis right now is probably rather popular given the uh, Kurt and Zeitgeist. But at least 10, 15 years ago, there were a lot of people raking it over the coals and saying, oh, you know, like a, a case of somebody. I think Morgan had this idea and he fit a lot of facts to form the idea. I feel like a book where the thesis, he cooked up, he cooked up the thesis before he cooked up the book. You know what I mean? Right. And he's yeah, trying to so, make it all fit. Right. And, and once again, it's got some interesting arguments in there. And I think there's some truth to what he's saying. But there's a much more complex story going on there that he just doesn't cover. Mm-hmm. So I really hate saying it, but very few colonial history books I've ever read what I consider good and certainly not accessible. You know, I mean, God, I, I've, read, I've read two books in the Salem Witch Trials. They really knew how to make that boring. Like they somehow made it the dullest event in colonial history. <laughs> Well, I mean, so, what's no, exciting I about townspeople going crazy and burning each other to stake, though? Fuck it. No, nobody's burned the stake. They got hanged, man. Oh, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I, I thought that yeah, one guy, it. Giles Corey, got crushed by a giant rock. Yeah, there was a guy crushed by a rock. That is true. Uh, but they were mostly hanged. Uh, no, fuck, man. Like, look, if you want to put the stay on witch trials, you're better off reading The Crucible and playing the video game Eternal Champions. All right. All right, uh, but anyway, I yeah, I didn't see that coming. Qualifies coming as a hot take. That qualifies as a hot take. <laughs> so uh, I'll skip ahead to the uh, to the uh, French and Indian War. Uh, I'm not really well read on this war. It's it's not something that I'm really into. I've read about individual battles, but that's through Osprey titles mostly. However, I did years back read the book "The War That Made America," which is the abridged version of "The Crucible of War" by Fred Anderson, oh. and I found it to be well read, well, means well written. He, he made some pretty decent arguments. He really placed the native tribes and native diplomacy not really at the center of the story, but in many ways, what he was trying to do, uh, what he does in the book, is say that that you know the native tribes are playing a complicated diplomatic game, and the way they play that game has a major influence on the war throughout. In that case, that make that case he makes very very well. Uh, probably the only thing I don't really like in the book is he was he uh, Fred Anderson is part of an, a, a reassessment of Louis Mount Calm as being militarily in, like incompetent or mediocre. Something I disagree with. I think Mount Calm was very talented. Uh, that said, Mount Calm did not use natives very well, but you know not every general is going to be perfect, right? Sure. Um, yeah, but well, the, the reason I mention is because in, in, in the book. Mount Calm's depicted as kind of like the stuffy French officer with ideas that he's he's a pretty good tactical commander, but his ideas actually only work in North America. And really, what they should have done is what the what Governor Vaudre wanted to do, which is just raid the which is just raid the frontier with with natives and um, you know uh, French Canadian hunters and whatnot. And that argument, I was like, wait, wait, you can't do that though, because that 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 strategy worked for the French in the previous colonial wars. But those wars, the British didn't send regulars over. And the French and Indian War, the British sent regulars over immediately. And I, I decided with Mount Calm. I think Mount Calm understood that they, that they had to try to hold out as long as they could. He tried to gain as whatever advantage he could by seizing fortifications when the British were on the weaker end. And that the raiding strategy would not protect you when the regulars came to seize major ports. And it should be kept in mind, I mean, you know, the, the British almost didn't take Quebec. If that fails, then who knows what happens, right? So anyway, a good book, even though I disagree with the Mount Calm part of it. But it is well written. It will give you an, a good understanding of the conflict and a fairly nuanced understanding as well. But moving on to the American Revolution, a few of the books I'm going to recommend here. First off, if you if you want just a good general history of the fighting, I'm going to recommend a book that has almost no scholarly bona fides at all. But I'm just it's just such a fun read called George Washington's War by Robert Lecky. Lecky was the was the man who wrote Helmet for My Pillow. He fought the Battle of Guadalcanal, and he's one of the main characters in the excellent HBO sh- HBO series The Pacific. Anyway, this is an account of the entire American Revolution. 
And um, while there's certain parts, of course, that Leckie gets wrong, uh, for instance, he has General James Grant dying after the Battle of Fort Ticonderoga because he didn't realize that General James Grant is not the same as Major James Grant. But those mistakes, they're really not that bad. Um, he's actually pretty fair to the British overall, although the Americans are more featured. I think probably my favorite chapter in the book was his chapter where he discusses the British redcoat, the way they're trained, their weapons, and everything in their experience, and it's just a superb piece of writing. And uh, I got to say, like it's funny, even though I've read this one early on and I've read so many Revolutionary War, War books since, to look back on this one and go, overall, Leckie wasn't really off. He got the, he got the basics right, conveyed it in a very entertaining way. So if you just want to start off with something on the military aspect, go there. However, if you want to get an upgrade from Lecky with the military stuff, you would cannot go wrong with John Furling. John Furling's probably the single best military historian of the American Revolution, I would say. What's the name of one uh, of his books? The, he, I'm going to mention two of them, actually. But the one for the actual fight in the Revolution is called Almost a Miracle. The American Victory in the War of Independence. This came out a little over 10 years ago. Uh, it's not it's not his best written book. I'll get to that in a sec, but it is pretty well written. It's accessible. It'll give you an account of the revolution. He has, I don't want to say a very negative view of George Washington, but this is one of the more negative ones because he, he kind of he kind of discusses the ways in which Washington became strategically obsessed with New York City and how Washington uh, certain talented officers Washington didn't cultivate, either out of uh, jealousy or fear that they could supplant him. And he does make critiques of Washington as a tactician, for sure. Uh, overall, though, he does say that Washington, of course, had good qualities. I just mean that if you're looking for, uh, you know, the George Washington of the song where they go, Washington, Washington, this is not it. Okay, All right? so six foot eight, made of radiation. Like, uh like like six like sixty feet tall like six foot eight weighs a fucking ton or something. Yeah. Opponents beware. Opponents beware. He's coming. He's coming. Great song. Yeah. Three but anyway, divine. So divine. <laughs> oh, that's right. He testicles. had to, that's yeah. <laughs> the part when the song where he goes, he saves the children, but not the British children. Oh yeah. <laughs> he saves the children, not the British children. That is probably uh, the I best think, part. I, I I will say this though. One other critique I have of this book is that he pays very little attention to the Frontier War. And to be fair, Leckie says almost nothing about it. And it's kind of interesting to keep in mind that there were these major, not major, but there were these pretty fierce battles being fought on the Frontier. Like that, the, there were major operations in the Southern Theater before the battles for Savannah. No, Almost nobody talks about it. So there's a lot of untapped things. A lot of things that John Furling and Robert Leckie don't talk about. And if I really wanted to see a, a truly great military history of the American Revolution come out, it would be one that really treats it as a global, it's not a global conflict, but really like gets into the meat of the Caribbean operations and the, uh, the Spanish uh, seizing British Florida and the frontier battles, because there's more going on than just Washington as merry men, right? Right. But overall, this is another good one, too. Uh Oh, one other thing I'll say, the Furling's, one of Furling's big arguments that I completely agree with is that we were losing the war until Yorktown saved us. I completely agree with that. I, I believe the cause was uh, was was pretty much on um, the last rung of the ladder. And I will say that is a hotly debated opinion amongst American revolutionary uh, historians. Those who don't agree with that, um, I've even had one, by, one guy tell me that my opinions were fringe and dangerous. And I was like, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, the defend of one volume account, that's the argument. Wait, fringe the and dangerous? The guy had nothing to say. I mean, okay, so I can if, if he honestly believes that, like, the American Revolution was inevitable, I the guess I can see him trying to call you fringe, but why dangerous? I don't – it was so weird, man. I just I, – I was just – I – I think he said dangerous because not like I was going to undermine the country, but I think what he meant was that I would give people the wrong impression about how this war was fought. Now, to be fair at the time, I was very much in this kick of the American Revolution is a much more like a European war than like a guerrilla war. And I still adhere to that, but I was a little more hardcore about it at the time. But I mean, for, for legit, like 
the American Revolution has guerrilla aspects for sure, but it's mostly fought like a conventional war. I mean, most of your battles would look like anything in Europe. Uh, Monmouth, Bunker Hill, Camden. The main difference a lot of times has to do with terrain and the lack of cavalry for various reasons. But anyway, um, so yeah, John Front's ultimate argument that we barely won the war is one that I agree with wholeheartedly. I, I think we barely won the thing. Uh, anyway, so John Furling, though, wrote another book that I think is absolutely superb. It's one of, if not my favorite history book, because it's so well written, it's so entertaining, but it's also very well researched and excellently argued, and that is called Setting the World Ablaze. And this is Washington, Adams, and Jefferson during the American Revolution. So you get all three of their stories unfolding as the conflict goes on, which is good because you get Washington with the army. You get Thomas Jefferson with domestic politics because he became governor of Virginia and also his involvement with the Declaration of Independence. And then you get Adams where you get not only some domestic politics, but of course right afterwards the diplomacy aspect after the war since he was sent to France. Uh, he gives a brilliant portrait of all three men. He points out their strengths and weaknesses, although this book is kind of notorious for being pretty negative about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, <laughs> well, is he an yeah, we, Adams we, guy? He's definitely an Adams guy. John Furling, uh, John Furling's one of four or five historians who rehabilitated John Adams at this time. And I'd say in the aughts, of course, that John Adams was like the favorite founder, if you will. You know, now it's Hamilton, of course. Um yeah, but anyway, so say, uh, Ben Rush all the way, man. Ben, yeah, well, yeah, you know, yeah, it's gonna be Rush Hour, right? Oh yeah, Rush Hour's coming. The thing, the thing about Thomas Jefferson, the Je Thomas Jefferson part. To be fair to him, Jefferson pretty much was a disastrous governor of Virginia. I mean, he did a very bad job. A lot of people thought he was ultimately actually done for. There are a number of people thought his career would never recover, but then he was sent to France as a diplomat, did pretty well there, came back, and then Washington tapped him for Secretary of State, so he he did rehabilitate himself, which always which proves that thing that's a lie. You know, F. Scott Fitzgerald is wrong. There are multiple acts in American lives, not just not just a first act. But anyway, so this is a good one. You'll you'll get several aspects of the revolution. Um I don't know if it's Actually, no, I think maybe it is. Actually, I'll say that. I think it's the best book to start off with this period since you're going to get politics, diplomacy, and warfare all in one with very good biographies of these three men. So, yeah, can't say enough for that one. I would definitely try out Setting the World Ablaze. Uh, the one other one that I want to mention is the Bernard Balin classic, The Ideological, Ideological Origins of the American Revolution. Uh, in the historiography of the American Revolution, this is considered one of the most important books ever written, because before that, the view was that the American Revolution was driven by things like uh, paranoia, but mostly material interest. That's the uh, Beard argument. Bernard Balin uh, really put the really said that actually this revolution was based on ideology. And ideology, at least, was a, if not the cause, it was certainly what created the world around them. And so he goes over the ideas that they have, the Enlightenment ideas, ideas of English common law, the ideas of being an English citizen. And those brilliant chapters in here is called The Contagion of Liberty. And his argument being that right after the American Revolution starts, you get arguments for universal male suffrage, the end of slavery. Uh, you get your first inklings of women's rights. And not that no one had ever mentioned this stuff before. They had. But it was fringe of a fringe. And there's a great book about that, too, called The Problem of Slavery in uh, Western Culture, where he essentially says that, you know, you had thousands of years in history where slavery is fine. And then something happens in the mid-1700s where people decide that it's not. And this book forms a good companion to that book as well. Although... The problem of slavery in Western culture, I would like to warn everybody, do not just run in and read that book. <laughs> that is like, it's like a 600-page monster. I, I won't lie. I didn't read every word. I zeroed in on the chapters I really wanted to read, and he had some good arguments there. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a doorstopper. 
you know? Yes, and it looks yes. like if you want the card like back, you will pay out the ass for it. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, that being said, another one I'd like to mention, though, since that's the topic of slavery, one that I remembered is a book called Generations of Captivity. Uh, that is a good introduction to slavery in America because you will learn about the different how slavery changed over time, the different experiences slaves would have had from one generation to the next. It is written accessibly, and it is also written by Ira Berlin, who is considered an expert on it. So this is one of those books that you have somebody who is an expert in a topic, and then maybe like 20, 30 years in their career, they want to write like a big synthesis accessible work. Yeah, you notice that trend? At least a lot of American historians do that. Well, yeah, I mean, that was kind of well, like yeah, I mean, what I was talking about like the... I'm really verberating when you're in bed. Really verberating when you're in bed. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, so anyway, that was what I was talking about with the Cartilage Sparta book, because he had been writing about it for a few decades, and he decided to write something that was compact and accessible. Is there still reverb? Uh, no, it's good now. Um, it's good also, now? Okay. Yeah, uh, the thing about cartilage that's interesting is, I honestly, looking at his early works, I think that he didn't learn to write until he was a couple decades into his career, because his early works are very, very, very dense. Oh, wow. I mean, the, uh, well, you got, the maybe writing you is rough, right. but then it gets a lot better. The what? Maybe he had a ghostwriter. Could be. I don't know. Um... Then again, I think that there are some people who do academic writing in a way which they're so worried about being precise that they don't care if the style is horrible. Yeah, um, I also, see. Yeah, he I was see. really obsessed with trying to explain little details like the exact legal status of the Neo Dames in Sparta, which is basically people who had Spartan full Spartan blood but didn't have enough property to be full citizens. So, I mean, he got really into those little details and um, wrote some very dense dissertation-y sentences as a result. Um, you know, some mm. of that stuff from, I think it was, was 1968 book, that stuff can be really hard to get through. Um, anyway, so yeah, but, but that's the whole thing. No, it's... When it it's to, um, but is is that is that a common thing? Because I do find that with a lot of American historians, if once they get their reputation up, they go like, "All right, time for an accessible synthesis book." You know, so is that pretty common in ancient history overall? Sort of. Um, okay. Some people do it. Some people don't. There are people who start out fairly accessible and stay that way, though. Uh, Peter Brown. Uh, we'll get to him later, but he's always been a very good writer, and it's always very okay. easy to read. So, so uh, I want to mention one last book for this period because I will mention one about the War of 1812. Uh, not as well read on this, of course. I think the best book is called The British at the Gates. The subtitle for the book is The New Orleans Campaign in the War of 1812. Almost half of this book is just an account of the War of 1812. So really what the book is is you get a basic account of the War of 1812, and then an in-depth analysis of the British back on New Orleans in 1814 to 15. Um, so what's really good is that uh, he gives a pretty good account of the ins and outs of musket combat and avoids the traps. You get a lot, with a lot of books on the Battle of New Orleans, because you know, the either either the few one of the only British ones I've ever read was essentially just worth toilet paper. I mean, very jingoistic. But the American ones are no better. And you always have those old myths about like, yeah, the British were idiots. You know, we hid behind cotton bales and picked off their dumb officers because they wore red coats. You know, which is the stupidest shit. And every tour guide in New Orleans repeats it. You know, it's the myth in America. It's a myth in history that I can't stand. Why don't they just right? hand out pieces of paper with that song? Uh... 1815, we took a little trip down with Colonel Jackson down to Mighty Mississippi, and just everybody sing in unison, and then hand out baked beans or some shit. I don't want to hurt people. <laughs> I don't want to hurt yeah, The Johnny Horton song, Battle of New Orleans. Yeah. And so I, occasionally I get some old dude to tour, tour on, do the Battle of New Orleans, and he's like, hey, isn't there a song about that? <laughs> so anyway, um, 
a lot of American accounts, they're just they're just awful. Like the number of bad Battle of New Orleans books out there are it's legion. But this one of four, it's not perfect. It's got some errors. Like it doesn't cover the role of the uh, Lafitte brothers very well. The pirates Jean and Lafitte and his brother uh, Pierre, who was essentially his fence. But I mean, to be fair to him, the errors in that weren't really. Un- the Lafitte brothers weren't properly understood until William C. Davis wrote like a fucking monstrous book about them. Although, dude, that guy, the Davis book about the Lafitte brothers, man, holy shit. I didn't know you could make pirates that boring. Huh. I mean, they are so boring in the book. But it's, hey, it's interesting you said about William C. Davis because I remember reading his book on the Battle of Newmarket, and he makes John C. Breckenridge sound like fucking Hannibal. <laughs> yeah, he liked Breckenridge. He wrote a big biography of him. Well, you know, Davis actually wrote a really good book about the creation of the Confederate government called "Look Away," and. I thought it was, you know, it was, it was a good account. And so I read the, Lef- the, the Brothers Lafitte. I think what happened is that he's, he's dealing with a topic that's so overly romanticized that he just wanted to have the driest language possible. It was almost like a, a dry dissection of a myth, you know, which I can kind of understand. There's a, you know, we have figures in New Orleans that are covered in, many are covered in myths, such as um, the voodoo queen Marie Laveau and the, uh, the woman who murdered her slaves, Delphine Lalari. And, I mean, there's so many bullshit books written about those, too. This poor woman named uh, Carol Murrow Long, who wrote an account of each one of them, and the books are not entertaining. And really all this is her going over the evidence with you and saying, like, okay, this is what the myth says, but this is what the actual evidence indicates. And, I mean, for me, I, I, I mean, for somebody who's not if I'm looking for an entertaining read, it's not going to be very good for me. I'm like, finally, you're like somebody's cutting through the bullshit. You know, so I love her books, right? But I'm not going to tell anybody just off the street, be like, hey, read this one. You know, it's a great read. It's not. <laughs> but anyway, right. uh, but yeah, but, uh, you know, love her, love, love her stuff so much. Um, can't wait to see what, what she comes up with next. But anyway, um, yeah, it's e, Riley's a good judge of commanders. Superb at explaining the combat, uh, cutting through the myths of battle. Showing that the way that it is um, important, the boy Battle of New Orleans is more important than you'd think. The war, you know, was still going on. And, of course, you have the effect that it has in New England with the Hartford Convention. So if somebody just wants to read the War of 1812 book, do this one. Because on the one hand, you'll get a decent account of the entire war. And then you'll get what is the best account of the Battle of New Orleans, which is really hard to come by. Sounds like a good package. All right. Um, so, uh, where do you uh, want to go now, sir? Well, um, first, now that we're moving into, I guess, the height of classical antiquity with my list, I'd like to look at democracy briefly, look at the Peloponnesian War, Alexander, and then a couple books on the successors. So, okay. one thing I've noticed when it comes to ancient works, at least works on the ancient world, is that in general, because the readership for ancient warfare stuff is much larger, this is where you have the bulk of the effort when it comes to writing popular history. So, it should come as no surprise that I can more easily make book recommendations on those topics than on other topics. Um, A lot of other books are written for much more specialist audiences, not to say that they're worse or less interesting. That being said... One book on ancient democracy that's pretty accessible and simple is First Democracy, The Challenge of an Ancient Idea by Paul Woodruff. Let's see. And, come on. The good thing about this book is that, along with the other book I'm going to recommend, it does a pretty good job of at least laying out some of the basic differences between ancient direct democracy and modern liberal democracy. So in an ancient democracy, or democratia, it is, you have the assembly voting on laws that are proposed by people, and they make laws together more like a town council. You also have very strict accountability. 
So <laughs> someone who proposes something that ends up being a disaster can then be prosecuted and possibly put to death for having a bad idea. So this is a very different system than modern democracy where the elite are never held accountable. Also, in ancient democracies, rich people are actually expected to foot the bill often. So again, very different. I mean, and also socially, it's a very different system. Even when we talk about a place being a democracy, there often was a huge slave population, as at Athens. One of the weaknesses of this book is that it doesn't really talk about democracy outside of Athens, but to be fair, no one outside of Eric Robinson does that, and I didn't put his books on here because they're rather expensive. But this is a decent introduction to the basics of Athenian democracy, even if it doesn't really go super deep. One that does a good job not only of talking about that, but also of giving a bit of comparison between ancient and modern democracies is Democracy of Life by Paul Carthage. So as I said, he moved on a long time ago from Sparta, and this is what he works on now. Or this was one of his more recent works. I think he just published one on a book on Thebes earlier this year, maybe late last year. But Democracy of Life is the most recent book by him that I've read. And probably about 75% is about Athens and the other quarter or so is about modern democracy. Mm. Anyway, it, it's a useful comparative tool just to out, lay out some of the major differences. Because I think that when we hear, oh, the Greeks had democracy, it's very easy to just assume that it worked similar to the ways that ours does. And it's just not the case. So yeah, if you want a fairly basic version of the differences i recommend the books by the two pauls um let's see now let's move into the peloponnesian war so the first book mm. to recommend here one that i think is a little underrated i've known some scholars who didn't like it but i think that they're wrong it's called song of wrath and this is by j.e linden where is this book? I'm getting a lot of weird romance novels here. It's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> Alright, Jay, here it is. Song of Wrath. So, it's a fairly good account of the war as a whole, and it has a unique thesis, the idea being that the strategies of both Athens and Sparta are predicated on the idea of winning a race to have the greatest honor. And the way that you build honor is to inflict wounds the other side can't respond to. So, for instance, the Athenians raided the coast of the Peloponnese to hit Sparta's allies, not just to harass Sparta and weaken their allies' adherence to Sparta, but also to shame Sparta, because now Sparta looks weak and pathetic by comparison. And he says the conflict as a whole was driven by the conflict between the two over honor. Namely, that because Sparta became powerful earlier, that they did not accept the equality of Athens because it was more of a newcomer. So Athens' goal was to humble Sparta and be accepted as an equal. Now, I'm not 100% sold on this bunny stretch of the imagination. However, I do think that it is an interesting attempt to get into the imaginations and minds of ancient people. Because obviously their categories for understanding the world are different than ours which to circle back to the point about democracy, if you don't understand that people had a fundamentally different worldview and fundamentally different norms, then you can't really understand the differences between democracy and democratia as practiced by the Athenians and others. <clears throat> so anyway, I recommend this if you just want to get into some of the meat of what it's like to really try to get into the minds of people from a vastly different culture. Because that's one thing ancient historians on a professional level do, is you try to understand why people did what they did based on their beliefs and values. And I feel like this is a pretty good entry point to that, especially since it's about a topic that's inherently interesting, the Peloponnesian War. And then there's the classic Peloponnesian War accounts by Mr. Donald Kagan. Um, Kagan is somewhat controversial, and a lot of scholars don't like him because he's an ardent neoconservative. That being said, while his political views are not necessarily well accepted by most of his colleagues, Kagan's scholarship is still very good, and he's written 
things about the Peloponnesian War in particular, which are very interesting. I think there's a new ebook of his four volume series on the Peloponnesian War. I'm having trouble finding it now, but it is a great value. And unlike, say, just reading Thucydides, Kagan does use other sources as well. Most people who are interested in antiquity rarely read Diodorus Siculus. So I think that that would be one recommendation I'd make to everyone if you don't know about him. Make sure to read Diodorus. He gives a lot of information you can't find elsewhere, especially if you're concerned with the successor period. He's the main source for that. But he also well, real quick on... question. Yeah, go ahead. Why people? Why do people not read him? Uh, so I have read him before referenced right and such. A couple reasons. One is because his surviving fragments are very long, um, so it's been published a lot less. And he's also considered, especially by classics people, to be an inferior historian. Because stylistically, it, he always follows whatever source he's drawing from. So his style changes. So people think, oh, he's a second-rate intellect. Which is probably true. But he also cites a lot of things that were missing. So that's, I think, and many, many, part of the reason why his work is often called the Library of History. Because he basically just follows different historians and tries to write a comprehensive history up to his own time. And he includes a lot of details and perspectives which don't make it into other works. So, for instance, he gives us the negative view of Philip II and Alexander, the Greek perspective rather than the Macedonian one. Um, so Real quick, I mean, not, not to derail us too much, but what is the negative view of those two people? Well, that they were tyrants taking away the freedom of the Greeks. And also that they were drunks okay. and degenerates. Okay, so I see the truth. Okay, Ex yeah. excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this, this volume, these big red ones, I just ordered these through the mail. I'm showing them on the screen now. Um, these are excellent. This is probably the cheapest way to get Diodorus in a physical form because this is a long work. This is not an ebook that you'd want to read, I don't think, because this will take weeks at a minimum to read through. It's in two volumes here. Otherwise, you have to get the lobes for this pretty much, and those are very expensive, as you can see. Actually, 22 bucks for one of these is pretty cheap. They usually run for 35 now, at least new. And I think there are 12 or 13 volumes in lobe of Diet or Siculus. So that's obviously not very cost-effective. So, but um, a lot of people don't really look at Diodorus, even a lot of scholars. So if you want to get the leg up on other people, read Diet or Siculus. I guarantee hmm. you most people around you have not done so. Although he wrote in the 2nd century BCE, so he only goes so far, of course. Gotcha. Speaking of uh, Diodorus and stuff he covers well, let's talk about Alexander real fast. There are two biographies of Alexander, both of which are a little old, but still good. One of them is by W.W. W. Tarn, and this is a fairly classic account. Here it is. And this price is way off. There's no way this is $800. But Tarn wrote a very thin but good book on Alexander. It's a quick read, but fairly thorough. He cites his sources well, and it's a very balanced portrayal. One thing I recommend against is Agnes Seville's book on Alexander, which is literally a book report of Tarn combined with and that's why boys in today's world, meaning the 50s, should aspire to be like Alexander. <laughs> so, not that one. Um, and the other one on Alexander that I enjoyed is by Peter Green. Okay. Peter Green is a very good writer. He did a lot of translation work on Herodotus. And in general, he's a big Herodotus fan. But I think that probably his best single publication was actually on Alexander the Great. And this book is very accessible, it's cheap, and it reads really well. So you can't really go wrong. And if you just want to get some general information about Alexander, this is a great place to start. Maybe Tarn as a primer and then Green for more of the substance. And then if we move in the successor period... Also, there are lots of Alexander biographies. Most of them are okay. I just don't think they're as good as the two I laid out. I haven't read any truly shitty ones except for John Granger's Alexander the Great Failure. But I'll give him a pass because most of his other stuff is pretty good. 
Um, let's see. Dividing. Well, first of all, we'll do Ghost on the Throne by James Rom. So this one is a great book on basically the successor period from Alexander's death in 323 until about 316. So it's very jam-packed with events. And it gives you a very detailed portrayal of all of the major players involved, especially Eumenes, who seems to be Rom's personal hero. What's interesting mm -hmm. about Ghost in the Throne and also Robin Waterfield's where did it go? Robin Waterfield's follow-up, Dividing the Spoils, is that they were released basically back-to-back. -back. Both of these, if I'm not mistaken, were published in 2011. And I assume they're working independently, because Robin Waterfield's an independent scholar. I think James Rom is a classicist living in Britain. And I'm pretty sure they just put these out, and it happened to be at the same moment. So I thought there was going to be a huge surge of Hellenistic scholarship at that time... And it has yet to really materialize. That not Why do you think that is? I don't know. I think it was just a weird coincidence that they happened to publish at the same time. Because I thought there was going to be a massive surge in the successors. But it was really just a blip. Okay. Yeah, anyway. Um, this is a more comprehensive look. Less detailed. But it goes all the way down to 281 when Seleucus was murdered by Ptolemy Carinus. So... Um, if you're looking for a broad overview of the successor wars, look at Dividing the Spoils by Waterfield. If you want a really detailed breakdown of the initial years, I would look more at Rom. But honestly, I'd read them both if you're into the successors, because it's definitely worth your time. So, that is all I have for that particular subset of books. So, I will pass the gavel back to Sean. Or not gavel, how about a... What do, what do people in those weird HR groups pass back and forth to uh, give speaking privilege? I don't know, man. I was going to say, like, maybe it'll be like uh, Lord of the Flies. You can pass back the uh, the, the, the conch or the... How do they pronounce it? You know what I'm talking about? The conch? Uh, the conch. There we go. The conch. Uh, I'll pass, pass you back the conch. The conch. All right. <laughs> So we're going to do a, a Civil War and Gilded Age right now. Okay. Uh, so with the American Civil War, uh, there's so they get, you, you got a few, I would say, that are going to be they're ex, they're accessible, good reads. If you're starting off with trying to understand the overall, the, the, the military fighting and the personalities involved, I will recommend Shelby Foote's trilogy, his Civil War trilogy. Okay. Uh, Foote, of course, was also a novelist. He was considered an even novelist. That is to say, he was considered good, but he never quite wrote that great classic. But his uh, his Shiloh book, I thought, was very good, which is the battle of Shiloh from the points of view of various fictional characters. I thought it was an excellent book. But anyway, so he's mostly known for writing this history of the Civil War. And it was supposed to only one volume. The fucker ballooned to three volumes. And he treated it like a novel. And he... <sighs> In some ways, that might you might think that would compromise things because, for instance, you have a point of view about each and every character in there. So Jefferson Davis to him is like Lucifer, for instance. Really? Because he sees him as well, he sees him as somebody who uh, who rebelled against God, that being America, and failed, and therefore fell. Ah. And uh, he, the thing is that he, it's uh, sure these are literary devices, but they're not ridiculous. And they're no more ridiculous than somebody deciding I'm going to apply, um, you know, intersectional feminist theory to whatever the hell in the past, right? Or Marxist theory, or like let's see if we can uh, let's see if we can dissect and figure out if uh, Baze the Bulgar Slayer was based, it, it, you know, it was like a based uh, trad con or something. I, I don't like this kind of stuff. I, I don't like the application of ideas and isms to people in the past. Who, if you said those words, they'd be like, "I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> right, just like that is you know? Spartacus as a Marxist hero. Yeah, exactly. Or you know, like Thomas More's proto-Marxist or some crap, right? I, mean, I don't like any. I don't like this stuff. I don't like it. So anyway, uh, so Foot decided to use like literary tropes when historians would be like, "Oh, literary tropes." I'm like, "Oh, whatever. You're reading some cockamamie theory that everybody's gonna make fun of in a hundred years." 
Anyway, Foote's an excellent writer. It's very accessible. Most of his judgments are fair. Uh, you're going to get a view of the war that is sympathetic to the South. I wouldn't say pro-Southern, though. I should keep that in mind. Uh, some people probably don't like his work, though, because, well, actually, a lot of people don't like his work because it is sympathetic to the South and because he is not dealing with issues of slavery as directly. You know, this is very much classic, like, maps, units moving around a map on a battlefield. So those are its limitations. But if you want to know the, if you want a pure military history in that sense, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd go with him. And also the politics isn't really that bad in the book, although he's, once again, his accounts of campaigns are, they're well written. I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's really a marvel, honestly. Yeah, I, mean, I know he's very and, entertaining uh, in uh, Ken Burns' documentary, too. I believe that's half the reason that a lot of people were some not a lot of people some people were like we should re-edit Ken Burns and take Shelby Foot out of there and they hate Shelby Foot in there because you know he's got a Southern accent who doesn't make the Confederates out to be you know the second coming of of uh, of the of Genghis Khan or something and I believe half the reason they don't like him is that he's much more charismatic, well spoken, and humorous than they'll ever be. Right. I think there's I mean, something to that. Uh, it's interesting you talk, bring up foot though, because um, one of my friends here who is a black dude, uh, he's actually a huge Shelby Foot fan. Even though he doesn't, he hasn't really read a lot of his books, but he just saw him on the Ken Burns documentary. He's like, "Man, that guy can tell a fucking story." I want to be like this guy. Exactly. Yeah. And hell, I mean, Shelby Foot in World War II got in trouble, like you know, getting drunk in a jeep riding around the woman. I mean, this is a guy who won. This is a guy who had a good time too. You know. Didn't like, women you know, usually mail him their panties after they saw him on the documentary and like ma propose marriage and stuff? Uh, yes, that did happen. Uh, I can go ahead and tell you that there were, uh, you know, when that match was out, I can think of at least two women who were middle aged that I grew up with who thought Shelby Foot was like the hottest thing. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you know, so yeah, but once again, I mean, well spoke, well spoken, articulate, intelligent, humorous man doesn't come across like he's got to stick up his ass or anything, you know? So these are all very good things about him when he's presenting the show. But anyway, yeah, no, Foot. I think Foot's very, very good. I think he is the best if you're going to go the military route. Um, that said, a few other books to talk about. You do have a, the Catton, what is considered the other one. In fact, one could say he's Shelby Foot for the Union, if you will. And he, of course, is famous for his Army of the Potomac trilogy, which ended with a stillness of Appomattox, which uh, very deservedly won a Pulitzer Prize, which I don't often say. Uh, Bruce Catton is an excellent writer. His, his, his trilogy of books is also, in many ways, very important for the way the Civil War was written about because he combined that military maps, you know, maps and chaps thing with discussions of the soldiers so there's always how the soldiers reacting after the battle what's their experience during the battle have whole sections of chapters about what was it like to be in the army and you know in that sense it's just an excellent book and also still in Appomattox, you know you're, you're getting ready for the showdown between lee and grant and he doesn't start off with that in a way well i mean he starts it off with a raid on richmond that backfired the dalgren raid but when you're getting Grant and Meade's army approaching Lee, he isn't like excited. He doesn't give you this sense of excitement that they're about to face off. He actually makes it into a funeral march. He says the old army of the Potomac was about to die. It was going to be destroyed in those battles. And it's very beautiful and moving. Uh, he's an excellent writer. Um, his books got a little worse later on. He became a hardcore Grant to the point where he actually contradicted some of the stuff he wrote in the previous books. But yeah, Army of the Potomac Trilogy is superb, and that's a great gateway to for, uh, for reading about the Virginia theater. If you're going to the Western theater, of course, one could do the Army of Tennessee or uh, Connolly's Army of the Heartland. But Connolly is a dry writer. Horn's pretty good. He wrote Army of Tennessee. But those aren't the ones I'd recommend from the Western Theater. From the Western Theater, I would recommend Decision in the West, which is the Atlanta campaign of 1864, written by Albert Castell. Noted for being an odd book in that it's written in the present tense. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Huh? It is a little bit. 
It is, it, but it works. His idea was, I want you to feel like you're there at that moment. And so he was really trying to get away from hindsight in depicting how events are unfolding. It actually does work. Uh, if I had half the guts of Albert Castell, I would do the same thing. But anyway, so he's an excellent writer. You get a good, fair analysis of the Atlanta campaign. Um, he's fairly negative on Sherman, maybe more than there's certainly more than I would be, maybe more than it's deserved. But I think it was I think it was uh, was worth it because he was trying to say Sherman's been overly lionized. He said he made a lot of tactical mistakes. Probably the most damning thing about Sherman in the Atlanta campaign is that most of the time he'd say, I think the Confederates are going to do this. They didn't do that. <laughs> so that's worth mentioning. Um, and his other argument about that is that the Atlanta campaign is what secures Lincoln's reelection. And he makes an interesting argument because while you're reading the book, he's also discussing how the campaign in Virginia is going very poorly. And he, in, in that sense, Decision in the West is also a very good book for making the argument that I make, which is the Overland campaign was a failure. Grant and Meade were defeated. Lee was not destroyed. The Confederates hold on to Richmond for many more months than they should have. Meanwhile, Atlanta falls. Why? Because Sherman didn't chew up his army. Anyway, this is a very well-written book. Good accounts of the generals. He's pretty negative on Sherman and Johnston, but I think that's kind of a correction because both of them were had people's opinions of their conduct during the Atlantic campaign were probably too high. He shows why that is shouldn't be the case. So that's a good one to go with. If you want to have a good book on the most famous battle of the Civil War, Gettysburg, you're probably best going with Stephen W. Sears. A Sears is somewhat of a controversial figure for some hardcore uh, Civil War historians and buffs because Sears almost never goes to manuscripts, collections. All this stuff is just published sources, official records of published sources. And a lot of people give him hell for that, but I got to be honest, man. Most of your manuscript collections don't have much of interest in them. I mean, you'll, you'll get some stuff here and there, right? You can get a good find. I'm not saying they don't exist. But most of the best stuff that you use when you're writing a Civil War book, I find, is a published account. Some old regimental history, somebody's recollections, of course, the official records themselves, the newspapers at that time. Those are far more useful than a random soldier letter. Unless, of course, you're trying to really, really get into the nitty-gritty and you can't figure out where the 25th Alabama was on April 7th, 1862, well, you might have to consult some uh, some manuscript sources. But even then, you'll, you won't find as much, you know? So anyway, just saying that I don't give Sears shit for that because I feel like a lot of manuscript sources sometimes are padding. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's just to pad the bibliography, to make it look as impressive as possible. Yeah, and those sources, you'll look at them, and they'll only be cited once, and it won't be for much of anything. But hey, that's the name of the game, right? There's something similar to that in my field, where a lot of people will do footnotes or digressions on etymology. So they'll find some word in Greek or Latin and put a learned footnote about it somewhere. And often it has nothing to do with their argument, and it's pretty much pointless, but it just shows, like, hey, I engage in etymology. I'm a serious thinker. I, uh, oh, smart dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I um, I adhere to the traditions of this field. I remember I read one book by a guy named Von Vase, and he's an excellent scholar, one of one of the best actually. But he was writing about archaic institutions in Athens, and he goes on a ten-page tangent about a word in Greek which translates literally to hambone collector. So at first when he started okay. going on the etymological rabbit hole, I thought, okay, he's going to find something interesting because this is fucking weird. He found nothing. It was ten pages of going back and forth, hemming and hawing, and eventually figuring out, yeah, I actually have no idea what this meant. And this must mm. have been super archaic, and this was a term that survived that had nothing to do with what it meant because these, this was some sort of naval tax probably, so it has yeah. nothing to do with pigs so far as we can tell directly. Um, it, they weren't collecting pe from people who owned pigs, so whatever original meaning this had got morphed over time, and basically had to conclude, after going through a bunch of different possibilities, that he had no idea what it was, or how it had morphed into that. So at the end of it, after going through this long, involved, dense argument, I was pretty pissed off. I felt like he had wasted my time. 
<laughs> and also, cool. if, if you're putting that in a manuscript, and if you're as distinguished as Hans von Weiss, whenever you do something like that, whatever you want to publish is going to get published. It seems like you should have the self-awareness about, all right, this attempt was a failure, let's just edit this out. No, no, no. It's going in the fucking book. Because I'm von Weiss, bitch. <laughs> I'm von Weiss, bitch. <laughs> yeah. God, that's hilarious. Uh, so just finish up what I mean about that with the manuscripts. Um, of course, I'm not saying that they're not useful. I'm just saying that the, they don't, they're not as useful as you'd think. But sometimes you run into some good stuff. Like I ran into a, a report for the 6th Kentucky Infantry that was written. It was never put in the official records, but I found it at the uh, Filson Club in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So... That was that's that's a manuscript find that I made where I'm like, excellent, this is good, this is this is going to be useful, right? Uh, but anyway, so Sears, uh, he can be a little too biased against certain people. So if he's a if if you're a person he doesn't like, you can do nothing right. Uh, that said, his analysis of commanders is usually pretty good. He does have his case of original insights. He's actually been a leader in trying to rehabilitate Joseph Hooker. Actually, Albert, Albert Castell, who wrote Decision on the West, was also big on rehabilitating Hooker. Um, and even though he concentrates the actions of commanders, he, he still conveys that sense of the horror of warfare. And I think he balances military history book very well between, you know, discussing the commanders, the tactics, and also discussing God isn't this awful. You know, not veering too far one way or the other. Although most books would veer too far into the like, well, the unit moved here and then it moved there, right? Sure. But yeah, if you're going to read an account of the Battle of Gettysburg, this is the best one that I have read. So yeah, I, I, I do like Stephen Sears a lot. I think he's, uh, I think he's one of the best out there, and I think his Gettysburg book is a just superb piece of work. Uh, but I'd like to leave the Civil War. I'm going to mention two Gilded Age books that I think are worth taking a look at. One is the Mark Summers book, The Gilded Age, or The Hazard of New Functions. Uh, it's essentially a textbook, but like an advanced textbook. But but Summers is just a lively writer. And But what's good about this one is that, yeah, as much as I love his books, he, he he's so into the age, he makes asides and jokes that you're only going to get if you know the era. So even though I found Rum Romanism and Rebellion readable, he'd make these statements. I'd be like, okay, whatever. Then he'd make a statement that would involve like an obscure aspect of the Civil War, and I would laugh. Or I'd be like, oh, I get what that is. This one, he kind of avoids that. He really is. This is really Summers at his most accessible. And if you want to really go get a handle on the Gilded Age and get beyond uh, some of the more cheap stereotypes that we have about it, if you will, or just like, uh, you know, the, the, like, like if you want to, if you want to get into the Gilded Age and more of its complexity, this is an excellent way to start that. Um, so yeah, very good book. And last but not least, one of my all time favorite books, and this is a bit of micro history. This one's very entertaining. It is called Carnival of Fury, Robert Charles and the New Orleans race riot of 1900. Robert Charles was a, a a black man. He was a laborer in New Orleans, although he was known to dress very well. He was eventually accosted by the police, and he killed them. And then the police were hunting him down. He actually killed several police officers. He ended up actually killing quite a few people. And he was surrounded in a building in New Orleans by a thousand people, and he held them off for hours. Because Robert Charles was an excellent shot, and these and he had killed so many cops that everybody who surrounded him were absolutely terrified to go in there and confront him. You know, thinking, "Well, you already killed." And by the way, one of the cops he killed was considered like the best police officer on the force, like the most brave, the most competent, and he was dead. So he kind of like like he killed the RoboCop of the New Orleans police at that moment. So that's why. He, that's why it took a thousand guys to surround this one man for hours on end. So this book gets into not only the background of Robert Charles, uh, the spree of violence, him being surrounded and the siege that occurred, and also the race riot that broke out. Because by this time, you know, segregations on the books, scientific racism is an accepted fact for people, and a race riot broke out, and 
you know, quite a few black people were killed. But that said, one of the things I also liked about this book that made it unusual, uh, well, not unusual, but made it, made, I, I, the one thing I liked about it was that it is not all just doom and gloom. You'll get these individual cases of people who are stay, standing up against the mob. So one case, there was a the streetcar, a black man ran into the streetcar and he's being chased by a mob. And then when he got on there, the woman who was on there, she had this giant skirt and she said, hide underneath my skirt. He did that, and the guys get on the streetcar, and they know he's underneath the skirt, and they say, ma'am, we're going to hang that man. We're going to hang him, right? And she says, well, to get to him, you got to lift up my skirt. And they won't do it because that would be seen as being untoward to a lady. So that's how she saved his life. So it's uh, one of the things I love about this book, besides it being well-written and being about something that's interesting and also being complicated – and we, if you're dealing with humans individual level, you get those complicated, nuanced stories. And I think that's more important is is important now more than ever in an age when everybody seems to be very quickly trying to pigeonhole and label everybody and reduce everybody to a few simple buzzwords, right? Sure. Like you know, based, problematic intersectional, you know, all the other things we're trying to do so we can rapidly organize ourselves into warring camps. And books like this uh, remind you that even in the heart of something horrible, you still had some good moments, but at the same time, this is a very horrible event that happened in New Orleans history. Maybe the worst, I would say. Yeah, another thing about the term based is apparently it is now in use by both the left and the right. So, and what was the left doing with different things? Uh, well, I know that one of Vosh's projects is to try to reclaim the word, so he uses it a lot. I don't know who else on the left is using it, but, I mean, he's got a pretty big following, so. He will fail. He will fail. Um, I believe the question of Vosh is he's going to implode, and it's a question enough, not if, but when. Probably sometime next year when everybody realizes that Biden is to the right of Obama. Yeah, um... But that's a topic we can avoid for now. Although he, he did make an appointment today that I found uh, pretty astounding, but I don't want to get into it. <laughs> oh, you don't? Well, no, but, well, but, but, I mean, we'll, we'll talk we'll about it. After. I'm sure, but uh, yeah, not yeah, at this we'll, we'll discuss it a bit after the books. Yeah. Why not, you know? Uh, but uh, before going on, uh, do you want to answer some uh, super chats before we get into uh, your uh, your next phase of books? Sure, we can try to find a few here. Um, okay, so Levant de- donated five dollars. He didn't have a comment, but thank you for the five dollars. Goodman four donated two dollars. He said, "You guys are the best thing about Sunday." Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, man. I love being on here. Michael Klein donated two dollars. He said, "Are there any primary sources that are readable?" I would say quite a few, actually, if you're talking about ancient primary sources, because most ancient writers tried their best to be literary artists. So, for instance, Herodotus, I think, is one of the greatest writers to ever live. Um, His writing style is very accessible, he's very entertaining, but he also has intellectual rigor. So he's got everything you might look for in a writer. And he also tries to make sure that things are poignant and they stick. He, he's also trying something very difficult. He's trying to write effectively a history of the world so far as he's aware of it. And he's trying to explain how you get to the point where you have this massive Persian Empire invading Greece. So, yeah, the, uh, Herodotus is, um, I think, one of the greatest writers to ever live. Xenophon's a good writer. Thucydides, I actually think the reason why his Greek is, quote, complex is because he's actually not a very good writer and that's a hot take because a lot of people in classics especially equate having quote good greek with being very complicated but i actually think the opposite thucydides is a bad writer brilliant man bad writer um plutarch probably a pretty good writer i haven't looked at his greek much but you know very much um Smooth, Procopius, somebody's talking about in the chat. Yeah, Procopius is a great writer. Talking about headless specters and uh, the Balkans being completely depopulated by plague and war. I mean, he's a little bit bombastic and insane, but uh, he's definitely a good writer. 
I'm trying to think who else stands out as being an excellent writer. Um, Polybius is pretty rough. Arian is a pretty good writer. The guy who writes about Alexander. Um, Tacitus is very difficult to read, in Latin at least, but in English you, you would think he's a very good writer. Sallust mm. is an excellent writer. Sallust, the guy who followed Caesar and then wrote the Catalinarian Conspiracy and the Juggerthine War. His writing is quite good. Cicero is a very I good agree. writer. Demosthenes is a very I good think, writer. I agree with that, but the, some of the ones you mentioned that I have read, like Sallust and Procopius, I thought they were both very good writers as well. Uh, what about what about Suetonius? Uh, yes, yeah, Suetonius is an excellent writer. So far, I haven't looked at his Latin, but um, in English, certainly, it's excellent, and of course, it's very entertaining. And then the, the Historia <laughs> Augusta, <laughs> that's full of some fun stuff. I don't, I have never looked at the Latin for that one either, but. Yeah, it's it's got to be fun. I don't know necessarily if it's the top flight Latin available, but nonetheless, he talks about Elagabalus, so you know he's not boring. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so those would be my recommendations. Not to mention, you know, the poets Homer, um, Virgil, and who's the guy Hesiod? There we go. Those. The guys are also very good writers. Sappho. So, yeah, if you're looking at poets, you can find a lot of people who are good writers. But um, do you have any, Sean? Uh, well, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of memoirs and a variety of those. Uh, most of these are got mentioned to be uh, military-related that are excellent reads. Um, the Vietnam War, you have a book like uh, Vietnam for Casey. That was a pretty intense Vietnam War book. I thought it was excellent, well-written. Uh, one of my favorite World War II ones is Japanese Destroyer Captain by Tamenchi Hara, who commanded a Japanese destroyer and then a light cruiser during the uh, operation at Yamato. Somehow he survived the war, involved in a lot of different battles. And also, you get a lot of critical hot takes on Japanese high command in that one. Uh, let me think what else they got. You got Sagittarius Rising, which is by an RAF pilot. You have Storm of Steel by Ernst Younger, the uh, German World War I vet. In terms of the Civil War, you really can't do better than Company H. I'm saying it that way since that's it's actually spelled A Y T C A. He's trying to make you say H like you're uh, in the South. Um, just a great read. Like you have like the horror of war, the excitement of war, the comedy of war, the absurdity. All the emotions are there, of course. Um, be those those primary sources for the things as well. Like if you're if you're looking at uh, the Holocaust, there's the classic book Night by Eli Wiesel, and then you also have Survival in Auschwitz, which is a very harrowing, intense book. That one's maybe a bit dry though, but I'd still recommend that one because it's just different from other Holocaust accounts. Um, one of my favorite things too is the uh, WPA slave narratives of the Dover Dover publications, which sells very cheap paperbacks as one just called When I Was a Slave, and you get a variety of accounts in there, and that really gives you a feeling for the uh, for the differences in slavery and regions and experiences. That's, I thought that was an excellent book. Um, yeah, so those are memoirs, though, and more in the bottom rungs. I'm more, I'm much more careful if with, you have a memoir written by, say, like a general or a politician because they have such a reputation to protect. I mostly know Civil War memoirs, uh, for the Confederates, you have like Richard Taylor and Edward Alexander both wrote excellent. Edward Porter Alexander wrote excellent memoirs for the Union. You have William Tecumseh Sherman and David Stanley. My favorite, though, of course, is Lydell's Record, which we talked about in a previous uh, uh, video. And the good thing about Lydell's Record is it's it's written by a Confederate who was involved in every theater of the war. Like he he. He was briefly involved at Bull Run. He had some. He was there for that. And then he was mostly in the Western Theater, but he also served in the Trans Mississippi, and he also served in Coastal Defense. And the, his memoir was not written for publication, so you really get his honest, unvarnished opinions, which you also get with David Stanley as well, which is why I like those. Um, you know, not 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 as much beating around the bush. So no, those are just a few that uh, that come to mind for me. I'd love to do a stream sometime where we uh, where we talk about uh, uh, memoirs and the uh, 
you know, the ways in which they're useful and the ways in which they're not. <laughs> yeah, that could be interesting. Unfortunately, because in ancient history there aren't very many memoirs, I haven't read that many. Okay. I think it'd be interesting to talk about them in relation to, you know, it's a primary source. You're, you have to use it. You can, But you also have to be very careful, especially when you're dealing with powerful people, naturally. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, but anyway, uh, no. So that's that's the, the lot of great primary sources out there uh, that I read. Oh, one I forgot. Um, somebody mentioned him in the chat. Ammianus Marcellinus. That's he's also a good writer. And among philosophers, the only one who's very smooth to read, I would say, is Plato. Um, Plato is very readable. Aristotle has some great ideas, but the the text is rough because it was based on lecture notes. So that can be. A bit painful at times. At least yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Um, That's part that gets me about Aristotle is that wait, wait. These books are lecture notes. Yeah, there were most of the stuff we have. His students took notes and then kind of wrote it out based on the lecture. And you have to imagine Aristotle. He famously founded the school called the Peripatetic School, which refers to the fact that he paced when he lectured. So he's pacing around. I don't know if they're following him or they're seated, just watching him. And then he would talk about his ideas. And he was very consistent and smooth in the sense that he would choose a very limited vocabulary on purpose and keep repeating the same points as his main pedagogical method. So he's very much one of those guys who thinks that repetition equals learning. Um, and okay. what's interesting is that we know that these notes must have been fairly accurate because we have two different versions of his ethics, the Eudemian ethics and the Nicomachean ethics. Most people just read the Nicomachean because it's a little more comprehensive and a little bit better written. But in terms of substance, they're basically identical. Both were written by students. One Eudemus, one Nicomachus. So um, apparently his style was pretty effective and it was hard to really misquote him. Unlike, say, Socrates. When you have Plato and Xenophon each writing accounts what Socrates said, and these two things are completely and totally incompatible. What about Aristophanes and what he has Socrates say? Uh, that's also a completely different Socrates. So it's a yeah. third Socrates <laughs> altogether. So yeah, there you go. So many, so many Socrates. Maybe he's one of those guys <laughs> who adapted himself to whatever audience he was with. I don't know. But we'll never you know. know. Speaking, of, uh, speaking of philosophers who actually write well, uh, I, I mostly like Rousseau's writing. And I do want to read the Confessions, which there you go, is another primary source, if you will. Uh, but I hear the Confessions is entertaining. Yeah. All right. Well, we have another super chat. Goodman four five dollars. Is there any good Civil War book on veterans and all the issues they have, like opioid addiction and dependence? I don't know of any book that deals with the drugs as much, and that's probably because these guys didn't really want to write about it or talk about it too much. We know it was there. Okay. Um, that said. One of the more recent books on the experience of Civil War veterans, at least the Union veterans, is called Marching Home. Uh, I found it to be a pretty well-written book overall. He kind of had this thesis that the Union is... because This is the thesis that's really been emerging, which I subscribe to as well, is that, yes, the Union veterans did reconcile with the Confederate ones, but they, of course, would always be like, but remember, we were right, and we saved the country. Now let's go, let's go, uh, let's go say the Pledge of Allegiance, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why we say the Pledge of Allegiance for class because Union veterans. Uh, so I believe that's important because I think the reconciliation thing got overplayed over the years. Uh, that said, uh, Marching Home also makes an argument that I think might be interesting, which is he thinks that reconciliation was something pushed more by civilians than veterans. One interesting thing in that book is he has a whole chapter where he discusses um, unions, uh, union prisoners of war and how those who are prisoners of war in those camps, especially if they happen to be in like Andersonville or, or anything else, not only really bond, I'm sorry, Marching Home. Yeah, Marching Home is the name of the book, and it's written by Jordan. But anyway, he's talking about how they really, uh, they were some of the ones who really pushed this idea that the Confederates had done something truly terrible because they had experienced it firsthand. And they were kind of most, he found them to be like the most hardcore of the Union veterans who were not willing 
to stay reconciled with the South. Um, that said, uh, it's got some problems, you know, I think, uh, but it, overall, it's a pretty good one. Uh, actually, you know, you know what I think is a more interesting one in some ways is the book Embattled Courage. And I mentioned Embattled Courage. It was about the experience of combat in the Civil War, and his argument was that these men had a romantic view of war, they went into combat, and that romantic view of war was destroyed. Now, in Battle of Courage, people have really eviscerated that book over the years. You know, mentioned the fact that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the research for it was fairly light. A lot of people said that the, uh, the, that the courage, uh, that the men didn't have, like, a moment, uh, that the soldiers actually kept up their morale. And I'm like, the thing about that is a lot of those people who wrote that the soldiers' morale was still high were looking at letters home, where a lot of these guys don't want to look like a coward, right? Sure. And I'm not totally defending in battle courage. It does have problems, but I really like the last chapter of the book where he's talking about how the war becomes romanticized afterwards, North and South. And he makes his one very interesting point, which is very true. When the soldiers discussed the war, they tended not to discuss the campaigns of 1864 to 65 hmm. when you start getting entrenchments and you know, when you're getting into a war that's more, that's, that's constant, it actually is starting to look somewhat more modern, if you will. They prefer to talk about 1861 to 63 when the war was much more Napoleonic. Ah. That was a very good observation, I thought. So in Battle Courage, I'd say, despite its flaws, is a good book to read about that because at least that last chapter, because he does talk about veterans' experiences after the war in a, a, a way that's still actually kind of provocative and interesting even all these years after it came out which i think it was published in time in the 1980s huh. uh, so anyway yeah but but once again uh, i'm not here to totally defend in battle courage it's got major research problems i just think that it as a book as a point of discussion and for some of its ideas i actually do like the book for that okay well um um let me right. see I think that's it for Super Chats. That's all we got for now. You guys have any other uh, questions you have, ask them away. Of course, especially if it's for anything uh, uh, book-related, any kind of recommendations that you're looking for. Uh, what is your next topic? So I think for the next topic, what I'll do is answer the person who left the first comment on the stream before it went live. Basically, what are some ancient books, or books about ancient science? Yeah, And I'm going to answer this broadly because it is kind of hard to find good and accessible material on that particular topic. The best place to start, if you're looking for a single volume, the book is called Revolutions of Wisdom by G.E.R. Lloyd. Okay, it's not okay. popping up. Let me find it. G.E.R. Lloyd um, also has done some interesting work comparing the Greeks and the Chinese. This is very interesting. Yeah, this is not well, this is not the right one. I'm trying I'm trouble finding it. Anyway, I have it on my bookshelf in front of me, but I'm not seeing it pop up here for whatever reason. Nonetheless, uh, G. R. Lloyd is sort of the go to guy when it comes to Greek science. If you're interested in the subject, then I would start with his works. This is um, the book I'm talking about, at least. is I think this is supposed to be it, even though the, this doesn't link to it right here. Um, this sort of summarizes a lot of what the Greeks thought about the natural world. And it's been a long time since I've looked at this book, so I can't really say that much more about it, but it is sort of the first and best place to look, I would say. While we're on the subject of Mr. Lloyd, I also would like to recommend The Ambitions of Curiosity. This is not so much scientific, but it does compare ideas from Greece and China. And if I recall correctly, it compares the historian Sima Kion to Herodotus. So it compares the ancient Greek way of writing history with a more Chinese method. And there are some major differences in the way that different cultures construct their historical records. So if you're interested in general in that subject, this book is a good place to start. 
I'm surprised the prices were this high. Maybe I just got this book when it was cheaper. I don't know. Um, so that's another one that I would look out for if I were you. But now it's getting into things that are truly accessible for the general audience, but also have some weight to them and involve science in some way. First up is Pythagoras. There's a biography of Pythagoras. Where is it? Here it is. No, here it is. Kitty Ferguson. This one goes through Pythagoras's life and also talks about the scientific and mathematical contributions that he made. One thing you have to understand about Pythagoras is that in addition to being a mathematician, he was also a cult leader. He founded a yes. cult in southern Italy. He founded his own city, so a utopia, the type of which Plato only wrote about, Pythagoras went and founded. And it would appear that he instituted his own political system there, and that all the women there most likely had sex with him. Another thing to keep in mind about Pythagoras is that we don't know for sure because of the fragmentary nature of the evidence, but it would appear that his obsession with numbers translated itself into him writing about issues of equality and equity. And while it's not a 100% confirmed thing, it is possible that he eventually became sort of a theorist of democracy. The idea okay. of one person, one vote. Um, so... Or maybe he was in favor of some sort of weighted system. It's not entirely clear. But I think that this book does at least a decent job of introducing the complexity of who Pythagoras was and all of the different things that he was involved with. And that's another thing about Greek philosophers in general is that while they did often have some highly rational thoughts, they also entertained what we would think of as extraordinarily irrational thoughts at the same time. They tried to reconcile those two things. They also mm -hmm. could be very political, as was Pythagoras founding a cult in his own city. So keep that in mind. Uh, speaking of philosophers, there was no real difference between philosophy and science in the ancient world until the time of Aristotle, when he really started to lay out actual disciplines. But before that, if you were a philosopher, it meant you were a lover of wisdom. So you could study literally anything, and there was no real limit. One book that's good at talking about that is another book by G.E.R. Lloyd, Early Greek Science, Thales to Aristotle. So if you're more interested in just the scientific side of things rather than the what we would think of today as pure, uh, philosophical side, then this is a good place to look. The book's a little old, but it is still easily available and I think gives a decent intro level treatment of all of these people. If you're looking at more of the religious side, in that case I would recommend The Theology of the Early Greek Philosophers by Werner Jaeger. And Werner Jaeger also wrote a series called Paideia, which was supposed to be a complete intellectual history of the ancient Greeks. But um, that one is a little bit dated now, and it's also rather lengthy and expensive. This book, however, is still pretty useful. So again, as I said, there was no firm division among ancient philosophers in terms of what they focused on. And in a lot of cases, we only have a handful of fragments for each philosopher anyway. So, mm -hmm. while, for instance, we know what Xenophanes was interested in, we don't know if that's all he was interested in. So, this breaks down one aspect of Greek philosophy. And then a more general treatment is by a guy named W.K.C. Guthrie, just called the Greek Philosophers. And I have to emphasize that this is very much an intro-level treatment, because Guthrie is a guy... I've read some of his translations of Plato... And his translations are not super precise, so if you're, say, writing a paper on Plato, if you see Guthrie's name on the translation, just know that if you're looking for a particular term or concept, he might not be translating it the way that will make it show up. 
He's probably not using a scholarly approach to the translation. He's just trying to make it readable. So keep that in mind for those of you who are in college or have interest in either philosophy or the history of ideas or whatever it might be. That being said, um, Guthrie is very accessible and his works give you a very good general introduction and general idea of what different people are interested in and what they have to say. Now, unfortunately, there is not a single volume summation of Hellenistic philosophy, at least not that I've found, that is both accessible and well done. That being said, there are a number of decent works on things like Cynicism and Stoicism especially, but you have to dig fairly deep to find them, and I'm not going to go through them here. Um, it, a few works have been published recently that are pretty good. One is called Circumference. And this explains how Eratosthenes tried to determine the circumference of the world. Hmm. Fairly short books. I don't recommend spending much money on it, but if you can find it cheap, this is a great read. Gives you an idea of the state of science and scientific inquiry, how the Greeks approached it. So that might be one place to start for those of you who are really into science. Um... Let's see. Ah, if you're interested in the topic of atheism, there is a book about ancient atheism called Battling the Gods, Atheism in the Ancient World by Tim Whitmarsh. This is a book that I think overstates its case for the existence of ancient atheism and very much probably overrates the significance of Epicurus. That being said, if you're looking for a work on the rejection of religion and antiquity, this is a great place to start. And it's not a long book, pretty accessible, uh, was published relatively recently, so it shouldn't be hard to find, and it's not very long. And finally, to round out the works on philosophy, let's see, is there anything, actually, wait, we got through them all, never mind, this was the last one. Um, oh. That's uh, the atheist one sounds interesting in particular. Yeah, I think it is. I, I've only really skimmed this one. I haven't really read it all the way through. Oh, the other one I want to talk about is called Thirst. Um, can't remember the author's name, though. I forgot to write this down. Let's see. I'll just type ancient. Okay, here it is. Stephen Mithen, Thirst, Water and Power in the Ancient World. This is one that I like to assign to students. Because okay. it talks, it really explains the importance of having fresh drinking water in pre-modern civilization. And this also explains why pretty much every city that you find from the ancient world is either near the sea or near a river. And the ones that we do find that aren't in those situations are still near deep aquifers, say on hills or whatever. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is something that's very basic, but a lot of people can easily overlook. And I feel like this volume is a good indication of the importance of water and also just gives the general impression that if you really want to understand the ancient world, you have to think about some very basic material considerations that aren't immediately obvious and that also aren't really discussed in the sources. And that's part of why I'm a little bit skeptical of people who claim to be historians but say that they only use primary sources. Because the primary sources assume a lot of things that you will just simply know. That you'll just know how they water their cities, for instance. Because they're yeah. assuming that you are an ancient Greek just like them. <laughs> and you're not. So this is where... And it's got to be particularly play. important. That's actually, now that you said, it has to be particularly important in your field since you're so further back, you know? Yes. I mean, I, I, I agree. I, I very much agree with that. Um, with the, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I guess to be fair, though, I mean, lots of Civil War history books have a pretty decent secondary sources list, and they'll, people will use them. Now, some will use them more than others. I probably maybe use them a little bit more, but it depends on if it's somebody I really trust, right? Like, if, you know, if you're... Um, if you're reading Timothy B. Smith, who does, a pretty, does some pretty intense research, and he just cites something... He mentions something. I'm just like, all right, Tim Smith said it's probably true. 
you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one last one before I turn it back over to you. Um, since we've already done philosophy, I thought I'd do one that is more Christian era church related. There is one book okay. that I found that I actually really like as an account of the growth of the early Christian movement. And the book is titled simply The Early Church by Henry Chadwick. It's a little bit old, but it is still on point, And it gives you a good and concise account of how Christianity spread throughout the Roman world. So hmm. that would be my final recommendation for this batch. Gotcha. How many more batches do you have? I've got Rome, and then I have other. Yeah, I only have one more batch left, and I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, do you? Um, okay. Well, I tell you what, I, I'll do some others. I don't have any. I don't have any Rome, though, of course. All right. But um, I've got. I've got some others. I'll do some others. But anyway, so for me, we're going to do American history now in the 20th century, uh, keeping to my. Sixth rule. I'm only going to mention six books here. Uh, I do not have anything for the progressive era of World War One. I've read some books of that era. I've not read as many as I should, but I have read some. But none that I would that I think off the top of my head that I would strongly recommend to anybody. That said, you get into the Great Depression and World War Two. Got got a decent amount here for the Great Depression. I've read a few books. The one I liked best. Is simply called, very fittingly, The Great Depression by Robert S. Uh, McIlvain. This is a pretty good synopsis of the era, talking about the individual actors and also discussing things such as uh, the values of the time, culture as well. This is a pretty good chapter on movies, even though he never mentions Gone with the Wind or The Wizard of Oz, but otherwise, pretty good chapter on movies. And to say is that the um let me see oh yeah 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 uh, that um he um really when he gets into the politics of it with franklin roosevelt it's really where this book shines in particular you start to see why franklin roosevelt's going to get elected president four times and i found this one to be pretty accessible too like he's able to describe these government programs without going too far over your head I mean, I, granted, if I wanted, if I was an expert on WPA programs, I'd probably want something some meat, some more meat on it. But for me, this was perfect for understanding the in, the basic ins and outs. What was the um, name of it again? That said, oh, just called the Great Depression by Robert S. Uh, McIlvain. If I'll I'll spell his last name, M C E L V A I N E. Got it. Found it. That said. He definitely has uh, presentism. There'll be random asides in there about like, oh my God, I can't believe Reagan's in here and I can't wait for the New Deal. Like the book was written right after the 1982 uh, midterm elections. And he, I actually think I still have to quote uh, here in the review I wrote. Uh, the 1982 congressional elections indicated that the Roosevelt coalition has still life in its, has life in it still. Uh, the coalition was effectively dead two years later. So it is kind of funny. And he has this kind of argument that, you know, once you put forth a progressive legislation, it's hard to repeal it, which is true. We know from the Reagan years, it's not impossible, or even the Bill Clinton years, correct? Yeah. And so there's a sense in the book where it is, it's in a way, a historic artifact because it's a person who's talking about how great the new deal was overall and therefore he doesn't understand that what he is praising is about to die right <laughs> that the new deal coalition is gone and a lot of its achievements are going to be repealed by both parties so it makes its own historical artifact and that bias i will say if you keep that bias in mind so understand that it is written by somebody who definitely thinks well, all that's going on in the 30s in america at least the Roosevelt administration is good. That said, I found it to be an accessible read. He explained the era pretty well, and he explained different avenues of it too. So I thought it was a very, very good introductory book, and I found it to be a pretty easy read overall. Now getting into World War II, my favorite account of war, 
just a single volume account is a war to be won by Williamson Murray and Alan Millett. Um, you can definitely tell these guys. What's good about this book is that it, it's it's well written. They make very very incisive arguments. They also have no problem taking a sacred cow and just slaughtering it. Like Omar Bradley in this book is depicted as kind of a blockhead. Uh, I don't agree with that, but I got to respect the fact that this isn't just like a stodgy, boring book. No, no, they make strong arguments. Uh, one of their arguments, of course, is the Italian army is a complete joke. <laughs> They, I mean, they all but say that in one line because they talk about how bad the Italian army's planning was before the war and their preparations on the officer level, for instance. So this is not a book written by guys who tap dance around things. They make very blunt arguments. Uh, that said, I thought it was very readable. They give coverage to all the theaters. And so, uh, yeah, I, think was, I thought it was a very good one. Uh, that said, if we're going to get into... Um, Another World War II book that's worth looking at. It is World War II at Sea, A Global History by Craig L. Simons. Craig L. Simons actually wrote a variety of Civil War books, a biography of Joseph E. Johnson and Patrick Claiborne. Both of those are excellent. Simons is a great writer, extremely fair, one of the fairest historians I've ever read. World War II at Sea is a good, solid read. You get a discussion of all the navies and the naval operations, and not just you know, battleships shooting at each other in carrier duels, but also he goes into some detail about amphibious operations, which is important because one of the reasons we're going to win the war is that we become really good at amphibious operations. So just thought it was an excellent book in general. And then last one for World War II is Pacific Crucible by Ian Toll. This is part of the Pacific War Trilogy. Funny is I read the sequel book to it, and I didn't like it. But I thought this one was excellent. I feel like for this book, he had some inspired writing. So you start off at Pearl Harbor and you go all the way to Midway. So this is the six months where the Japanese Navy reigns supreme in the Pacific. There are some problems in the book. Some of the organization's a bit off. And Japanese the Japanese will be almost wholly absent. And then suddenly they appear and you get some of their perspective. But that said, it was a, it's, it's a good read, for especially if you want to know the Allied point of view, the strategies they're using to uh, deal with the conflict and with Japanese success. Um, very well written. Hey, what's hilarious is I was like, this is a real page turner. And I was like, why the hell do I keep reading this? Oh, that's right. I really am liking the way it's written because it can't be that much of a page turner. I know what happens next, right? Sure. You know, although it's always fun when you read... <coughs> When you're like really young and you read a history book and you actually don't know who's going to win. You ever, you ever did that back in the day? Um, like you, you pick up a random history book and you'd be like, I don't know who's going to win this one. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that ever happened to me because I guess by the time I started reading history, I was at least 12 or 13. So I kind of knew the outline in terms of who won and who lost. I, I didn't always because I was reading those children's World War II books like World at War. And I would start reading them not really knowing the ending. I mean, I didn't know what was going to come next, right? So I'm learning the battle midway for the first time. I actually didn't know the Japanese were going to lose. I mean, I suspected it. They lost the war, right? But I don't know. I mean, they won some stuff, right? <laughs> sure. Uh, or was Battle Stalingrad. I'd never heard of Stalingrad in my life. I, mean, I, 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 you know, I, I was reading that. I was like, oh, God, the Germans going to win this or happen i'm like oh okay they lose you know and they got all these grisly pictures and they're like dead soldiers and stuff but <clears throat> anyway sorry it was more not so much the war but individual battles when you know younger reading about them i didn't know who was going to win necessarily uh but anyway uh, ian toll's book was was written in that way where uh, i was for the first time ever well not the first time the first time in a long time i was really engrossed with what was going to happen next even though i kind of already knew what was going to happen next right Anyway, so getting to post-World uh, War II, not much I can say for the 1950s. <coughs> as far as the Vietnam War goes, I've read a f quite a few books. And you've got some good ones on there, but I think the overall best topic was actually George, best book on it is George Herring's America's Longest War. A, a concise account of the conflict that I thought was very, very fair. And I say that because, of course, it being Vietnam, a variety of books that I've read will go too far in one direction. 
I have actually read a book that's very pro America and Vietnam, like, you know, cautiously pro, but more much more positive. And then I've read things like Marilyn B. Young's The Vietnam Wars, which to me read like Ho Chi Minh propaganda, but that's just my opinion. Uh, so very hard to get a book that was as fair as Herring's and uh, thought it was a pretty good read, too. Oh, by the way, George Herring used to teach at University of Kentucky. He was uh, there before we got there. Oh, really? Yeah, apparently he ended up like marrying one of his students or something. Oh, damn. Well, well, you know, the kind of thing that back then some people would frown upon, but that was okay. But now that'll uh, get you some serious shit, right? Yeah, there's uh, a... Yeah, there's a... Uh, oh, you got rever reverbing again, but... uh. Reverbing? Yeah, it's not doing it now, but it was for a second. A anyhow, uh, that's weird. Doing anything different than the mic. In the classics department here, there are two professors who that was the origin of their relationship. Uh, she was his grad student, and the thing is, they've been together so long now that even though she's the younger partner, she's probably old enough to retire, and he's he's like in his mid eighties, so. Um, I guess most people aren't aware of it, but there was this one professor who told me this, even though I already knew it, as if it was like the latest scandal. Like, hey, did you know that uh, they used to be teacher and student back in the day? <laughs> yeah, I knew that, but it, that was decades ago. If nothing happened back then, I don't think anything's ever going to happen, so... whoop de shit <laughs> But anyway... That was the guy who right. was really difficult to work for. I think I told you about him. Actually, I was TAing for him when I visited last year. Okay. Anyway, that guy sucked. Uh, that last one I've got for you is uh, The 70s, The Great Shift in American Culture, Society, and Politics by Bruce J. Shulman. Um, excellent book here. Uh, very well written. Makes some interesting arguments. Essentially saying that the world we live in is a product of the 70s, which he considers a great unraveling. That was the opinion of David Bowie as well, and a lot of people. That's really when uh, we start going off in a lot of different directions. And what he talks about here is the end of this American idea of there's an American ideal that we're all trying to, to, to get to, right? Yeah. So he talks about the fact that at this era, Americans started to become really interested in the idea of like, oh, who are my ancestors? You know, Irish, Romanian, uh, West African, whatever that be. At the same time, the kind of integrationist dream was dying off. And it was being killed off both by the defeat of busing, of course, but also by this idea that, you know, what does integration even mean? Does it mean that we abandon our culture, for instance? He talks about that. He talks about the presidency of Richard Nixon. <coughs> He makes the entire argument that Nixon was not a liberal president, that if you look at look at it, Nixon was using the cloak of liberalism to force conservative agendas through and was actually ratcheting up to become a hardcore conservative president when Watergate really blew up in his face. Talks about the ways in which American culture became more Southern, if you will. You know, popularity of NASCAR and uh, you know, other things as well, and also the rise of Southern politics, too. Uh, the Failures of Jimmy Carter. I just thought it was a pretty well-written book that made a great case for why the world we live in. I mean, it's a product of any decade, of course, but the 70s really did indicate a shift in American culture that we still live in to this day. A, a fractured, paranoid nation of people desperately looking for something to believe in. Huh. huh. And it's pretty much what we've been ever since, right? Yeah, I guess yeah. so. Well, uh, that seems like a pretty interesting book. Um, so it's the cover is great. It looks so 70s, you know? It looks like something that would be laying on the table in a conversation pit. <laughs> I love the cover of this book, man. It's one of my favorite book covers. I just looked at it I was like, man, that is really 70s. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it definitely captures the vibe. Yeah. Hey, that's the best thing to do. But anyway, uh, I'll do a few other books as well. But uh, if you want to go ahead and do, uh, you know, Rome and your others, uh, go ahead, man. All right. So let me talk about some Roman books I think that you should be on the lookout for. First of all is Carthage Must Be Destroyed by Richard Miles. 
This book came out about almost 10 years ago now. But it is still one of, if not the best books on Carthage. Miles goes through a lot of primary sources and tries to reconstruct the history of Carthage from its foundation to its destruction. And unlike most accounts of Carthage, which either look at the archaeology or focus on Carthage's conflict with Rome, he has a very balanced approach, which includes the long history of Carthage and, and its wars on Sicily against the Greeks. So, if you want to get a proportional history of Carthage, which kind of tries to tell the story from their perspective as much as possible, this is the place to go. That being said, all the sources we have on Carthage are either Greek or Roman, pretty much. And then a little bit of archaeology. But the archaeology is somewhat problematic because the Romans built their own city over Carthage. So, we don't have all that much original Punic stuff, at least in Carthage proper. We have some stuff throughout the rest of North Africa, however. So... Yeah, we do the best we can. But I think that Miles provides a pretty good account. It's very well written, easy to get through. A bit on the long side, but definitely worth it. I mean, there are definitely a lot worse ways you could spend your time than reading this book. Um, another one that stands out to me is Caesar, A Biography. Uh, who wrote this one? This one is by Christian Meyer. Uh, where oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've seen that one around quite a bit. So, um, Meyer is a leading scholar, maybe it's Meyer, in Germany. But okay. most of his books, he either writes in English or they're translated in English. I don't know exactly which one. And he also has a lot of connections with a lot of the leading scholars in America. A lot of people either studied under him or studied under one of his students, something like that. So this guy's got tendrils all over the place. This book he wrote in the early 80s, I think originally. And the idea here is that Caesar was an outsider. So he tries to view Caesar as this force from kind of out... A, a guy who's kind of internally... He, he views himself as an outsider within Rome, even though obviously he's a patrician and he goes through the curse of Norum and works his way through the Senate. But Meyer's basic idea is that Caesar actually was an outsider in a lot of ways. Now, I think the fundamental premise is a little flawed and also tries to be a little too complex with trying mm -hmm. to explain how he's an outsider without being an outsider. Obviously, Caesar played the game. He just played it better than everybody else would be my view. Um, that being said, despite the fact that I think the central premise is frankly ridiculous, the idea that Caesar's an outsider, which is why I'm having trouble expressing it, because it's just such a such a counterintuitive and out-there idea. Despite the fact that I reject this premise entirely, the book itself is still an excellent account of the politics of that period, as they pertain to Julius Caesar. So if you're looking for a really good overview of the period, and probably still the best biography of Julius Caesar, then this would be the one. This one is a lot stronger on political stuff than it is military, however. So be forewarned, because I know a lot of you in the audience are more military-oriented. But if you're looking for something that really goes into the nitty-gritty of Roman politics, this one is a great book. Um, Michael Grant is a popular historian. We already talked about his Rise of the Greeks. Another one I like by him is the history of Rome. Um, this one is pretty straightforward, and it goes from the foundation of Rome all the way to the fall of Rome in 476. So it is all-encompassing, and while the level of detail is not extreme, I think that it actually might be the best one-volume summary of Roman history. So, if you're looking for just a cover-to-cover -cover read which covers Rome from its foundation to the fall of the Empire in the 5th century, this is that one stop where you can get all of that. And then figure out from there which parts of Roman history you want to study in more detail. I believe this was actually my first introduction to Roman history. I might be a little off on that, but I'm pretty sure this is the first full history of Rome that I read. And I feel oh, like I chose a pretty good one with this one. What were you saying? 
Oh no, no, I was, I was saying uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah, actually, that's this book is on my uh, has been on my to read list for a few years now. Yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty good one from what I recall. I mean, I'm sure now if I was to reread it, I'd probably find several things to disagree with, but I guess that's inevitable. Books don't have to be perfect. It's fine as long as they yeah. are useful. Um, let's see, another one that I could recommend. Some of these maybe are a little more obscure. One of my personal favorites is called Hannibal Crosses the Alps by John Previs. Um, this one has a lot of focus on the route that Hannibal took to get into Italy. And Previs actually went into the Alps and tried to hike a lot of the paths that you could go through to get an army from Gaul into Italy. So that part of the story is pretty interesting. It's definitely different than most of the stuff we've discussed here. This is a case of someone trying to do an in-person investigation and just kind of guess what must have been based on the landscape. So it's a very different book than almost all the things I've discussed, at least, which are mostly are based on text and occasionally archaeology. And because it's so different, I think that it's worth looking at, because this is a very different approach to ancient history, and one that I find pretty useful. So, um, I want to say he got money to go research this, so he basically got paid to go hike in the Alps. What a lucky bastard. Uh, anyway... <laughs> Yeah, that's the, if anybody needs to figure out some route of an army somewhere um, and you want to give me money to go figure it out, I'll gladly go hike in the mountains to look for a goat path or whatever. Just FYI. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's that. This is a good book. And I think he makes a pretty compelling case for the route that Hannibal took. And then he also finds the route that Hasdrubal probably took in 208. Um, another one that's interesting, let's see, while we're on the subject of the Second Punic War, I know I skipped backwards in time, just forgive me, it's based on the way I wrote my list. Um, yeah. This has the stupidest title of any book I'm going to recommend, it's called Scipio Africanus Greater Than Napoleon by B.H. Liddell Hart. So, despite the fact that the title is extraordinarily British and unnecessary, the book itself is very good. To the best of my knowledge, this is one of the very few books written by someone who understands military operations, which discusses Scipio Africanus as a general. <clears throat> so, um, if you're looking for something that will give you a decent view of Scipio, and why he matters, and why his campaigns in Spain were so damn impressive, this book will do it. Just ignore the subtitle. There's actually very little in this book about Napoleon. I assume he only put that in there just to prove to his audience that, yes, indeed, I am a very British man. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Beyond that, what else do we have here? Um, this is one that is probably going to be a somewhat controversial pick. But if you're looking for a Marxist history of Rome... And this is basically a subgenre. A lot of them are very expensive because they weren't published in great numbers. Most people who are really into Marxism don't have a very strong interest in antiquity, unfortunately. However, Michael Parenti, who's mostly known for writing other stuff, did write a history of the fall of the Roman Republic called The Assassination of Julius Caesar, A People's History of Ancient Rome. And one thing that you have to note about this is that while it obviously does try to push the idea that Rome fell effectively because of corruption, elitism, and the contradiction of its institutions. It also actually does do an excellent job of summing up what happened in the late Republic. In fact, if you're looking for a book that's about 200 pages or less, which goes through most of the major players and events, it's hard to beat this one. That's actually why I've assigned this on several occasions to classes I've taught. Uh, this book gets to the point. Michael Parenti, despite being a theorist by nature, does not fuck around. He gets to the point, he's very concise, and he doesn't really make too many errors. He leaves out a lot of detail, but there aren't very many things I can point to in this book and say, that is objectively incorrect. So it's actually a pretty good place to start if you just want a general, fast account of the fall of the Republic, 
And also, as I said, it's probably the only affordable and accessible Marxist history of Rome that I can think of. There also are some histories about Catiline, but then at the mm-hmm. end, these disappointed scholars will note, you know what? Not a very good Marxist, is he? Uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we need to talk about for Rome? Um, I'm not going to go through the four books, but Stephen Dando Collins. Uh, he originally wanted to write a comprehensive history of all of the legions of Rome. I guess apparently he tried to do that in 2012. I haven't seen this book. But the ones I am familiar with that I know are good, he's written four about different legions. Caesar's Legion is about the 10th legion, and it follows the legion throughout its life. So not only the campaigns of Caesar, but also its long history being based in Syria. He also talks about um, the 6th legion. He calls them Cleopatra's kidnappers, another Caesar legion. Apparently he wrote a book on the, uh, the American conquest of Hawaii, which pretty off-brand for him, but that's okay. And let's see, where's the other one? Nero's Killing Machine, that's about the 14th Legion. That one's really good. That's probably his best one. And Mark Antony's Heroes is about the third Gallica. This one is a little bit weaker, but still very good. But between those four books, those are all good reads. And while he does do some goofy stuff, like use the term colonel to describe legates, uh, overall, if you're yeah. looking for a general account of the Roman Legion, how it works, where they were raised, and what they did, sort of a unit history, that's a good read. And if you're also looking for something to get for a dad or an uncle who's in the history but doesn't go super deep, the Dando Collins books are actually a great stocking stuffer. FYI. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, yeah, I, stock those stockings, but stock stuff. I'm sorry, man. Stuff those stockings. Let's get some books in here. I mean, yeah, you know, you know, if I if, if, when I go to Christmas, I mean, if somebody wants to get me a book, I'm cool with that. I won't complain. Oh yeah, totally, man. I just, uh, I just, I'm just picturing like putting books in the stockings. That's all. Well, you know, I mean, uh, at least I know it's something I'll use. So is that. Quite true. Quite true. Whatever. Um, oh, and my last one for this subject is actually Byzantine rather than Roman. And this is a book by a renowned scholar, Anthony Caldellus, who happens to be a very good writer as well. It is called Streams of Gold, Rivers of Blood, The Rise and Fall of Byzantium, 955 AD to the First Crusade. So this basically starts out in the reign of Constantine the Seventh, the late years, and then goes through Basil the Second up until I believe the reign of Alexius the First, Comnenus. So pretty good chunk of history, and it's very detailed. His use of primary sources is excellent. Um, it's entertaining. It doesn't drag, and he also engages in a lot of scholarly discourse while still being accessible. So oh, good. And it's also pretty cheap right now, so this is a great buy. And if you're interested in Byzantine history, this is, I think, a must-buy. All right. So that would be one that I think is pretty much a must-read if you're interested in Byzantium. And this is, by the way, probably the book that's been the most helpful to me as I've been trying to get the next volume on uh, Basil II ready. So I found I, I find this book to be extremely useful, and I use it pretty yeah. frequently. So um, I'm gonna. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You get more for uh, for this one, or should we uh, do my others? Yeah, you can go ahead and do your yeah, others. You oh, oh, one one final one, and I, I'm sorry for skipping ahead to get to the Caldell's book, but the other one I want to recommend is called Caligula, and it is by Alois Winterling. This is basically a revisionist history of Caligula. He argues that Caligula is misunderstood and that the sources deliberately misrepresented him. Caligula was not a madman. He was just kind of an asshole. And he was trying to mock the Senate because they were supposed to be advisors and they talked about their wisdom and their greatness. But when he went to them as a young man with no experience, he was only 24 or so when he came to power... They had nothing to offer because the way that they were accustomed to governing is to wait to know to learn what the emperor wants them to say and then tell them that. Because Augustus didn't really need advice. 
So he would sort of give hints right. to some of his underlings. Then they would go and talk to other senators, and other senators would make proposals that Augustus would like. And then that was the way the system worked. Tiberius could also do the same thing, basically, even after he left Rome, if you work through Sejanus. When you get to Caligula, you have a guy who's about 24, no previous experience, so he actually needs real advice. And that's part of why he empowers his uncle Claudius so much, because Claudius will be more likely to give him real advice, whereas the senators are too afraid to make actual recommendations, and eventually Caligula gets pissed off. And then when they start to try to talk about who should be emperor after Caligula dies, when he got sick that one time, at that point he gets super pissed. And so he starts to shame them and make fun of them. That's why the, the horse is a consul. It's not a sign of insanity, it's just him making fun of the Senate. So I think that Alois Winterling actually makes a compelling case that Caligula was not insane. And that his reasons for doing what he did actually make sense when you think about it. But Caligula was not necessarily known for his tact. And ultimately, he offended the Senate, and that's why he got assassinated. I'll definitely check that book out. Yeah, I'm also surprised to see it this cheap, because this is a scholarly publication. But uh, absolutely worth reading. So, uh, I'll hey man, but people over. love their Caligula. Yeah, I'll uh, toss you the conch. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do about six of these here on some of these other topics that are of interest to me. Uh one is The Mongol Art of War by Timothy May. Uh, this is all about the army that uh, Genghis Khan created and how he did it, the kind of tactics and strategies they used. I thought it was a very accessible book. He went into enough detail where I, where I knew that I was learning quite a bit, but he didn't go into as much to where I was getting lost in the weeds, especially considering that while I know some things about the subject, I'm in no way an expert. Uh, he uses several cases to explain the way the Mongols... Uh, use terror tactics. Uh, he also has an interesting argument in here that the Mongols individually are not actually great warriors. So he says that they probably weren't superb swordsmen. They're great horsemen and archers, though. And, of course, they work well as a unit. But in his opinion, the Mongols would have problems when they would have to fight true warrior elites. And his examples are the samurai, the Malamukes, and the medieval knights. Now, all th now, all three of those groups, the Mongols did defeat them, but all three of those groups would have some success against them. So I thought that was an interesting argument that he made, and I am not—I don't know if I'm entirely sold on it. Some people I know, uh, one person I know doesn't really actually believe them on that one, but it's an argument worth having, you know. Uh, so anyway, I thought it was a very good book on the topic. Uh, another one, this is one of my all-time favorite history books, is Batavia's Graveyard by Mike Dash. This is about a Dutch ship that in 1629 crashed an island off the coast of Australia. And this wasn't just any Dutch ship. When constructed, it was the largest ship in the world. Like this, like the Titanic of its age. Anyway, the, uh, the, the, the admiral in charge of the fleet left to go get help. When he returned, the third in command had butchered most of the survivors, including babies. And it proceeded to, uh, him and his followers proceeded to rape most of the women. And we're setting up a medieval cult, and we're going to try to grab a ship and become a, become a bunch of pirates. Completely insane story. Uh, I've actually been to Western Australia and seen parts of the ship and artifacts from there. Of course, when people have excavated the graves and the island where they crashed, uh, they find lots of human skeletons, usually with their heads caved, caved in, because that's how they were killing people. Uh, so you get a book that is, in some terms, it's, it's, it's a history of an event. It's a bit of a micro history because you do get very a lot of particular details about some of the characters. And it's a history of the times as well. So the, he talks about the way the Dutch East India Company operates and how, how the way they operate influences the, uh, the, the path the ship takes. So for instance, the path they were taking that crashed them into the island was something that they, there was a path that could... The way the current was, I'm not the current, but the way the winds were, it could carry you faster to Indonesia. But the charts for Western Australia are, Western Australia are poor, so a variety of Dutch ships actually crashed the coast uh, at, in this time period. The most you know, famous, infamous one being Batavia. So, great read, insane story. But I do like to say that there is so much horrible stuff in here. Like We're talking like you know, murder, torture, 
war, rape, that I was said that um, a misanthrope, this is exhibit A in why people suck, is this story. <laughs> Do not read this to be up like okay remember carnival theory how i said it's really bad but there's like these bright moments in there sure they're like no bright moments in this book it's all horrible <laughs> anyway uh there's also a bit in there about dutch religion at the time because the uh, guy who led the rebellion was himself a, a bit of a heretic but anyway um i'll cut ahead to uh, world war ii where americans aren't involved uh, this is Russia's War by Richard Overy, a uh, respected British historian of the war. Uh, I find this is an excellent introduction to the Eastern Front. Naturally, it's all from the Soviets. It's mostly from the Soviets' point of view, but there are discussions of what the Germans are up to as well. He makes a pretty good argument for how the USSR was able to recover and then eventually smash the Germans. Uh, one of his big arguments in there is installing radios and tanks. You know, which I'm always like, yeah, once you put radios and tanks and you can control the skies, you're pretty much going to win a lot of battles. Uh, so I, I find this a very good account, um, a pretty fair account of the conflict as well. Also explains its importance in Russian history. And it's kind of that idea that uh, the, you know, like, like, this, like people in Russia will argue about Stalin, right? But they all have this feeling of, when the Germans came, we did band together and win this awful, horrible war, which is very important for their national pride and all the rest. There's also something else to be said about this, is too, um, about the uh, the way Russian soldiers reacted to that. And actually, that gets me to another book, I want to, the next book I want to mention. That is A Failed Empire. Uh, this is a book about... Uh, the fall of I mean, I'm talking about the fall. It's about Soviet diplomacy. It's written by a guy named Zubuk. Uh, I found this to be a very good read. He goes through each one of the Soviet leaders and what they were trying to accomplish. And one of his arguments too is that after the USSR defeated the Germans, the the, the your average Russian soldier, while of course Stalin was still as very repressive afterwards, there was this general feeling of. We just went through this horrible war. You kind of owe us something. Like you're, like this isn't going to be. We're not. We're not going to revert fully to the purge, if you will. And what he kind of makes the argument is that uh, that kind of optimism, or at least hopefulness, for uh, the Soviet project carried on into the 1950s, but then by the 60s starts to dissipate. But anyway, uh, I thought it was a, uh, an excellent book there. Especially the chapter on Brezhnev. Yeah, he did a really good job explaining uh, Brezhnev and why he approached uh, leadership the way he did. It wasn't both the way his personality influenced his pursuit of foreign policy, but also uh, the fact that the Soviet Union had a certain, um, I guess, say, like uh, the, the, the world they found themselves and was influencing how they acted as well. But now my final ones will be involving the French Revolution. If you want a great one-volume history of the French Revolution, go with The World of the French Revolution by R.R. R. Palmer. R.R. R. Palmer, Palmer was a great historian. Uh, he has a share of controversies. He was one of the guys who argued the reign of terror wasn't that bad. Um, <laughs> I don't wow. agree with him on that point, necessarily. But I do agree with R.R. R. Palmer on one thing, that the reign of terror was relatively short. And Palmer did not like communist revolutions. And when he, one of the big projects he had in his life was he was he was trying to resurrect. He was trying to save the idea of revolution as a force for good. And by that he meant that revolutions of the 1700s, and 1800s, which he called democratic, I'd more properly call them republican. Those revolutions represented real progress. Communist revolutions did not, in his opinion. And one of his arguments is that. In the French Revolution, the reign of terror happens because of military emergency. An emergency passes, the reign of terror ends. In the USSR, the reign of terror never really ended. It just kept going on. Hmm. Anyway, uh, he has great books like, uh, like The Age of the Democratic Revolution, Twelve Who Ruled. These are all fantastic books. But I think the world of the French Revolution really impressed me because it wasn't just a history of the inner workings of the French Revolution, but also how the French Revolution is influencing Europe, how the European monarchs are reacting to it, and how it's varied from one to the other. 
one of his arguments, by the way, in the world of the French Revolution is that it's hard to export revolution. And a lot of that has to do with not only the fact that certain countries have different experiences and expectations, also that uh, the revolutionary country itself has has different um, views of other countries. So, for instance, your average French revolutionaries didn't really care about Polish revolutionaries who were trying to uh, ally with them. They just didn't care. You know, so the, the internal politics will influence how you're going to export revolution in the first place. One of the things that I've always, one of the last things I want to say about Palmer that I really, really like about him is that he, he did resurrect an idea that he very much opposed the idea that the French Revolution was over and everything became great again. Like, you know, no more wars, monarchs are in charge. Wasn't that a horrible thing that happened? And he points out things like, for instance, you know, we, we view the Netherlands as being this like a satellite state of France, but it should be kept in mind that when the Allied con when the coalition countries invade the Netherlands in 1814 and, and, and also in 1809, they found the populace was, if not outright hostile, they just didn't care. It wasn't like they arrived and they were treated as liberators or something. And so one of the ultimate points is that the French revolutionary ideas affected all of Europe, stayed around, and will influence the course of European history afterwards. I know that's not like a, doesn't seem like a dynamic argument, or I'm sorry, original argument, but it should be kept in mind that there is another counter argument that the French Revolution was really just this long, just this bloody, stupid mistake, right? And pointing out that, yes, there are mistakes made, and there are definitely criticisms you can make of the French government. I could actually argue Palmer is probably a little too nice to the French revolutionaries, but he does get to the meat of things. Also, one last thing, he offered a great critique of Edmund Burke, who I do not like. <laughs> And he pointed out that Edmund Burke, his copies of uh, his thoughts on the French Revolution um, were, didn't sell that much. Uh, Thomas Paine way outsold him in England. And that while Burke was touted as this person, they're like, well, he backed the American Revolution. It's like he did, but he also didn't pay much attention to it. Like the fact that the American revolutionaries were writing constitutions, people in France were like, this is amazing. They were studying these constitutions. Burke couldn't even look at those things. You know, it's um, he makes he essentially makes an argument that Burke's a very shallow thinker, which I agree with. I think he's one of the most overrated thinkers of the last three hundred years or so. But anyway, great one volume account worth getting into. As far as Napoleon Bonaparte goes, I'll recommend two books, and then this is gonna close it out for me. There's Felix Markham's Napoleon. Uh, this is like one of the shortest Napoleon biographies ever run in, ran into, but I thought it was very, very fair to him. Uh, good points and bad points. Uh, a lot of the people who are very negative on Napoleon aren't big fans of Markham. They think he was a little too nice to him. I'm like, ah, maybe, but I found this an accessible book, best one volume account that I can think of that will cover Napoleon, not just as general, but also you know, ruler, monarch, um, member of a Sicilian family. I'm sorry, not Sicilian, Corsican family, which means they're obsessed with vendettas, that kind of stuff. And then there's Blundering to Glory by Owen Connolly. Uh, it's an accessible book, only I think less than 300 pages, and it covers all of Napoleon's military campaigns. So you get a good accessible account of all his campaigns that actually has an original argument. His argument being that Honestly, Napoleon was oftentimes taken by surprise. That Napoleon wasn't working on perfect plans. That actually Wellington was right. When Wellington said Napoleon didn't really plan, what Connolly said is that Napoleon was what he called a good scrambler. That he was good at reacting to things. And that's because he had a good staff. And he himself was a workaholic with almost inexhaustible amounts of energy. So Connolly's other argument is that as Napoleon gets older and fatter and he loses his energy... That's when he becomes a worse general. Oh, that's where you got that argument from. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, because I, I think when when I first met you in Kentucky, you would always talk about when Napoleon got fat as if that's like the defining moment in his career. It is, though. He was, he was, I mean, the guy was really, really thin, right? And he, 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 after 1809, he wasn't on campaign for two or three years. So when he went to the front to Russia, he couldn't wear his old uniforms. He was embarrassed. And the men who saw him, people who hadn't seen him in years, said, our emperor is now a fat guy. 
you know wow uh, so, so what somebody should create though based on that is sort of a weight-based theory of history <laughs> like try to create a comprehensive version sort of on the same level of seriousness of the 14 year freshness test right no oh, yeah <laughs> and then just it definitely, you definitely who knows you definitely do see in 1812 that napoleon's energy is going down and some of that's probably because he had spent so many years well being so energetic that he probably wore himself out um and he's a man he didn't eat a lot but once he just kind of sat down and he had slightly bigger meals and finer meals, he just gains a lot of weight. So I get what you mean. You, it may sound weird to you, but Conley makes a good case that, you know, <laughs> the boy packed on the pounds and it was never the same man. <laughs> um, but yeah, an no, original argument about the Napoleon's effectiveness. One of the last things I mentioned about Blundering to Glory, some people who have read this book will occasionally think, that Connolly's saying Napoleon's a bad general because the plans don't perfectly work. That is not what he is saying. He's just saying this idea that Napoleon was, or even that in warfare, that you are uh, masterfully coordinating things is just not true. You know, um, that a lot of war, especially in this period, is how do you react to changing circumstances? And Napoleon was very good at reacting to changing circumstances. <laughs> but anyway, I think that might close it up uh, for me. Okay. I, I mean, there's some other book, good books I can mention, like, you know, The First Total War. But while that one's superbly written, uh, I don't think it's a book that I would tell somebody to read first. I think you should have some background before tackling that. Sure. All right. Well, I'll try to choose six from the list I put together and uh, close this out. So, the first book I'd like to recommend, if you're looking to get into the French Revolution, is another book which is very readable but has some serious issues, and that is Citizens by Simon Shama. Now, oh, yeah, this one. You mentioned earlier that one of the books was basically a protest against Reagan. This is the opposite. Simon Shama was not only talking about the French Revolution, but basically writing a love letter to Ronald Reagan. He was very critical of the revolution and clearly was a law and order kind of guy who thought that it was horrible that people were up in, up in arms in the streets. And he tried to argue that the counter-revolutionary forces were more socially progressive than the revolutionaries. And he's talking about some of the scientific advancements that some of them were making or that some that had been sponsored by the court or whatever. So uh, Shama has a very unique perspective in the sense that He's anti-revolution, but at the same time, he was arguing in favor of progress, and he's trying to argue that the revolution was stymieing progress. So it's kind of a convoluted argument, but the reason, yeah, why, no I kidding. The rec reason why I recommend the book is not because of the argument, which I think is kind of dog shit, but kind of like with the book by Christian Meyer on Julius Caesar, the book itself contains a lot of good information, it's well written, and it provides a great overview. So if you just ignore the argument and then just look at some of the substance of what's here, it's actually pretty good. Um, it's so pretty long, but you can get through it pretty fast, I find, because Shama, if nothing else, is a very skilled writer, even if a lot of his ideas kind of suck. Um, next up... The Cheese and the Worms. This is a book that is still being taught in grad school today. And it's also an excellent example of a microhistory from the 16th century. This is about a guy who was ultimately put to death by the Catholic Church for being a heretic because he used his experiences as a miller and as a guy who makes cheese to explain the universe. And he sort of had some heterodox views about theology and other things. And he's basically just a local guy who was eccentric. Today, this guy would be a conspiracy theorist, maybe. Or somebody who has his own model of physics, like Howard Bloom, who apparently has, a, has his own ideas about physics, which is weird because this guy's a music producer and not a physicist, but whatever. It's certainly nothing that you would think, hey, we should put him to death over this. Um, anyway, uh, with with the, in the case of the gentleman who is the subject of this book, he ultimately was tried and executed for his views and 
Carlo Ginsberg, the author here, goes through the trial transcripts and talks about the norms of the day. And it's a useful book in the sense that it lets you know that even if there is an official view of the time and an official theology from the church, this does not mean that everybody accepted it. There were people who were running around who were individual eccentrics, who had their own ideas, and this book is a great example of that. So the idea of people going their own way and having their own crazy ideas is not new. It's just something that people talk about now as if it suddenly popped up yesterday. Um, let's see. All right, I'm going to make it. Yeah, I mean, like, who is that Greek philosopher? He's a pre-Socratic who said that if uh, horses could draw pictures of the gods, they would look like horses. Uh, that, I think that was Xenophanes. Uh, I, that, that line's um, that line's always struck me because I'm like, okay, so um, so people are already thinking this whole god thing is uh, BS, <laughs> like long, long time ago, right? Yeah, and that's part of yeah, why I recommended that. the book on atheism. Um, Although his point might not have been that there are no gods, it might have been more simply that we don't understand the gods if we think that they're just like us. But right. we only have fragments of what he wrote, just like with Heraclitus and Democritus and all those other guys. So, you know, it's hard to really say exactly what he was trying to get at. Gotcha. Anyhow, uh, my next recommendation is by someone who is... I would say still semi-disgraced in the historical community, but nonetheless, oh, he has some interesting books. One quick thing I want to say. Uh, I do Second Cheese and the Worms. We read that in class together. I liked it as well. Yeah, it's a great book. Very entertaining. Um, can't go wrong with Cheese and the Worms. I can't say that about many of the books we read in grad school, but uh, that one is definitely a great read. Nor can I. My French Revolution uh, class, I uh, was kind of looking at some of the books before I got ready for tonight. I was like, man, we read some real stinkers in that one. But I will say, Summer's Gilded Age class, we did read stinkers in there too, but that was actually the point. You wanted to bring in popular books or books people thought were game changers, and then we would just rip them to pieces. Huh. So it, it, so it was a strategy, I'm just saying, all right? <laughs> I had a professor when I was an undergrad who was teaching a grad class, and she was telling me about what she did, and she made them get this book on the Seleucid Empire by a guy who died before he finished. So it was all a bunch of typewritten notes that were then compiled by the guy's wife and published. So the volume is full of typos and errors. Uh, the, font, the font face is really hard to read. The publication quality is super low. And to add insult to injury, this is like 170 bucks a copy because it was through some really obscure publisher. She made them get it and then read it. And then the point of, the, of having this book, of ordering this $170 book was, this is how you don't do history. Because this was the yeah, worst book you could uh, think of. Yeah, $170, man. I mean, all right, whatever. I mean, yeah, it was a, and she was usually a great professor and uh, still one of my favorites of all time. But man, with that one, she really kind of fucked it up. And, uh, I see. You know, I even said basically that she got a little mad, but it's okay. Um, anyway, uh, next up is a book by Stephen E. Ambrose. As I said, semi-disgraced individual within the historical community, but he was a good writer. And when you know, the, was, I'll, I'll go ahead. I do want to say something about that, man, because, I mean, like, I, I took a class where he taught and everything. You know, he was around New Orleans and everything. So, anyway, he's, like, disgraced because of some plagiarism. Yes. Correct? But it didn't seem like it was that bad to me, really. Like, it seemed more like a mistake that was made. And if I think I've got a person like Doris Kearns Goodwin, who I think did something much worse. I mean, she got a free pass. Right, but I guess when Obama likes your book, that's what you get, huh? Well, also, I, 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 I say Doris Kearns Goodwin commits the sin of being extraordinarily boring and not having a point. But that too, uh, I think Stephen Ambrose. Whatever my problems with him, I I think what that was, it was. I think it was less a case of he had did something so terrible, and more a case of these people are jealous that you're successful. And you don't write the kind of history they like anyway. I mean, fuck. 
he wrote a biography, he wrote a massive biography of Nixon, where he, his conclusion is Nixon was actually pretty good. And he had protested Nixon, by the way, when he was a young man, when Nixon came to the to, came to a college campus. He didn't even want to write about Nixon. His his, his like uh, his agent was like, "Oh, you should do Nixon because you know he's, he, there should be like a new assessments of him." It, you know, it'd been ten, fifteen years, and I, I liked the Nixon book when I read it. It was a while back, but yeah, you know, he he was like he was writing popular military history, patriotic history. He wrote that Nixon wasn't that bad. I'm of the opinion that what happened is they got him on small potatoes and they just crucified him because they're looking to crucify him. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Also, when a when a historian writes something and it sells well, this often does occasion a lot of jealousy and backbiting from colleagues. Exactly. Because to really get some to write something that will sell a lot of copies, you pretty much have to write either traditional political history or military history. Um. Unless you happen to write something that happens to just break out randomly. Uh, Foucault would be an example of somebody who wrote academic works, which then somehow took off. But I think that's largely because French academia writes in a very accessible manner to begin with. And they're very literary in the way that they put ideas forward. So unlike English academia, where you're sort of ordered to have a very structured argument... And French academia, the writing is much more smooth, and that's part of your job is to write well. So I think, I think also the uh, the Foucault thing has to do with the fact that his his work could apply to to not just it was, I mean like not just history. In fact, if anything, he's kind of a shitty historian in many ways. Um, you know, but people who are getting involved in philosophy or are uh, uh, or trying to apply his ideas to say analyzing uh, uh, a piece of literature, I think that's why because he had a real he had real interdisciplinary reach, if you will. Yes, uh, he he had his tendrils all over the place, and he even called himself rather than by any discipline merely a thinker. Um, but I think that's a little pretentious and ridiculous. Um, that being said. Uh- Speaking of his history, I did read his volume on sexuality in ancient Greece, and he actually does really well, even though it oh, is a complicated good. topic. He actually pretty much nails it. I mean, not 100% you know, not perfect, too, but pretty damn good. I'm not too surprised about that with him on the sex thing. I read Discipline and Punish. I thought it was a terrible book. Um, he had some interesting arguments in there, but... I, I I ultimately did not uh, did not like nor really agree with it. You know, I thought it was kind of I thought it was also part of the um, a, the left attack on the Enlightenment, if you will. Hmm. Which that's a whole other thing. If you get into like the historiography of the Enlightenment, that's a fascinating topic because the Enlightenment really does go through periods where people are either extolling it as this great moment in history or. Oh my God! This 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 era sucked, and that's increasingly since Foucault been happening more on the left, if you will. Hmm. You know, but that's all a different story. We should actually do a stream one time. We just talk about the Enlightenment in general, some thinkers and other shit, you know. And um, you can talk about Montesquieu and his Roman obsessions and stuff. But anyway, uh, oh. so yeah, go go ahead and carry on, sir, with uh, Mr. Ambrose. So my personal favorite book by Ambrose, because I read a lot of his stuff when I was a teenager is The Wild Blue, The Men and Boys Who Flew the B-24s Over Germany, 1944 to 45. Um, The story of the 15th Air Force is largely neglected in favor of the 8th Air Force, which flew the B-17. But in fact, there were more B-24s deployed, and they had a higher capacity in terms of bomb load. They also had a larger crew, so the B-24 suffered more casualties, but also dropped more bombs than the B-17. And I'm pretty sure the B-24 was used much more extensively in the Pacific than the B-17. So, total, this was a more impactful bomber. Although the B-17, of course, is more iconic. And there were some... Oh, go ahead. I think the B-17 was used more in the Pacific than the B-24. Oh, really? But yeah, this, yeah, yeah. I think, I think so. I'm going to just look that up and check, but... Uh, but no, this sounds like a great topic, really. I didn't even know he wrote a book about this. Yeah, and there are some interesting people <laughs> he finds to interview. Just like with Band of Brothers and his other books, he finds certain soldiers and follows their experiences. One of the people he found was none other than former uh, 1972 presidential nominee George McGovern, who was a that is correct, pilot. Yeah. And that's actually how I first learned about George McGovern, was reading this book. 
So, um, I think it's a fascinating read. It covers an aspect of World War II which often gets neglected. And I feel like he did a pretty good job. I mean, granted, I'm not an expert on World War II, and I don't know if he plagiarized anybody or not. Nonetheless, the book itself is still pretty good. So, if you're looking for an Ambrose book, this would be the one. Moving on from that, the next book on my list is one that I read relatively recently and that I really enjoyed. It it ended up helping me prepare quite a bit for the World War II list that we did. It is called The Fall of France and Nazi Invasion of 1940 by Julian Jackson. Mm -hmm. And this is a detailed book about the war preparations of the French prior to the outbreak of World War II. So a lot of the details I was talking about in that video when we were talking about France's participation, almost all of them I got from this book. Okay. And I, I assume that there's a lot written on the subject in French. I haven't really looked. But in English, this is one of the only books on this topic, at least that you can figure out from the title. So I got this from the library a couple years back. Really enjoyed it. It's well written. It gets straight to the point. It goes through French politics in general, but mostly focuses on uh, governmental institutions and military policy. It also talks a lot about the major generals, especially Gamelin, and uh, the major politicians at the time. So if you want to know why France did as badly as it did in 1940, this book does a really good job of explaining that. It also goes through quite a bit of detail about the far right in France prior to the invasion. So the people who were more or less amenable to Nazism but wanted to make a French version. So it also gives you a good, a good uh, idea of the spectrum in France at the time, how you have also a very powerful far left as well. So I would say that if you're looking for 200, 250 pages worth of information about France and World War II, this is the place to get it. And the price, as you can see, is pretty decent. So there's that. Okay. That, that's, uh, that's one I'd like to check out then. Yeah, Definitely. I recommend it. He also wrote a sequel about occupied France, so going up to about 1944 or so. And I haven't read it, but it looks pretty good. Another book I'd like to recommend was my first ever introduction to Chinese history. China's Imperial Past by Charles O. Hucker. And this one, I think you should be able to find pretty cheap. It does use the old school Wade Giles system, and it also is not up to date because I believe it was originally published in the 70s. But, uh, so therefore you won't learn about the Xia dynasty or anything of that nature. But it does do a good job of laying out not only the basic history, but also the details of Chinese culture. So, for instance, how did the bureaucracy work? What did Confucius believe? What is Taoism? If you have any questions about that, you will learn about those issues right after you read the basic overview of the period. So the way it's structured is you have a section on the historical overview, then you have the cultural part. And you do that three or four times by the end of the book. And... While this is not up to date, and I'm sure there might be a better alternative out there, this one is still pretty good if you want to learn about everything from the Shang Dynasty all the way until the Qing Dynasty. So I highly recommend this, especially if you can get it for $1.61, as you see here. And last, and actually kind of least, <laughs> is Little Known Wars of great and lasting impact. Uh. So this one is basically just a book with a lot of illustrations which goes through some fairly minor conflicts that you might not know much about. You might not even know that they happened in the first place, either that or you might not have taken the time to look into them. For me personally, this was useful because this is the only thing I've ever read about King Philip's War, for instance. It also has an account of the big revolt during the Reformation and some other things of that nature. I forget what all is in this book, but I believe there's 12 different chapters, each one covering a different conflict. And 
while none of them are exactly definitive accounts, if you're just looking for, I guess what you might call the quick and dirty on some wars that you may or may not be all that interested in, then this might be a good place to go for that. And I use the example of King Philip's War because that's one that I don't have a lot of interest in, but I am glad that I read the 20 or so page account in this book. So those are all of my this recommendations. Is Sounds like a very useful book. Uh, I'm going to close out one last one I just thought of Okay. Uh, that I read a few years back. Uh, Hitler and the Collapse of Weimar Germany by uh, Martin uh, Brosat. I found this to be a very accessible account, not particularly long, but one that was comprehensive and went over the political, racial, economic, historical, ideological, and the personal factors. That's an important part, too. I think this book really well balanced the idea of both the, the uh, impersonal forces, contingency, and the nature of personal choice, which is not the same as great man theory of history, if you will. At least as a, but you know that um, that, uh, that that there are like people do make pe there are powerful actors who make individual decisions that reverberate. Of course, uh, one of the more controversial aspects of this book, and one of the more controversial aspects in discussing uh, the Nazis, of course, is the degree to which they had any kind of, did their relationship to capitalism, if you will. Uh, I'm a belief that they had a more negative relationship to it. I will say this book does go into that that argument within the Nazi party. Uh, one of the arguments also made is that at a certain point, the economic elite of Germany decided if it's either the communists or the Nazis, that we're going to back the Nazis now. And that argument is very much debated the degree to which that was important in Hitler's rise. He certainly makes it seem to be so. But anyway, thought it was a very good book and introduction to the topic quite accessible. And that closes it up for me as well. Okay. So that's all so we, the recommendations we have for now. So I'll shift back over and look at the chat. Let's see. So next super chat is from Goodman4. And he wants to know, what are we doing for the holidays? I don't have Christmas planned. Uh, Thanksgiving, I'm just going to go to uh, uh, my friend's place and hang out with her family for a few hours. That's in uh, Destrehan, Louisiana. And then I don't know what I'll do afterwards. I mean, I just get drunk somewhere. What about you? Um, we're going to get Cracker Barrel to go and hang out with my girlfriend's dad. Who uh, I, Last year, my girlfriend's mom died. So, uh, you know, oh, okay. her dad's fairly lonely, and we're going to hang out with him. Uh, well, hey, man, Cracker Barrel's got good bacon. They also carry a lot of novelty sodas. <laughs> uh, Next up is Ken Cook. I almost said Ken Ham because I was thinking about a video I did a couple weeks ago for some reason. No, Ken Cook, very different person. Four ninety nine. thank you, sir. Would love to see you guys rank the Soviet leaders one day. P.S. Thanks for the book on Martin Gare, Sean. Oh, you're welcome, Ken. Uh, I remember the day my dad bought that book at the um, the uh, a library sale in Algiers. Uh, so I believe that's actually inscribed in the book. I thought about keeping it, but I I have so many damn books here right now, and. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was told you one thing related to Spanish history, and that was the best that I had on hand. So uh, take care of the book and enjoy it. It's an interesting story. Yep. And that seems to be it for Super Chats right now. You want to do a little bit of uh, uh, some uh, a mile, a little bit of politics stuff then? Sure. Just, you know, you know you'll exchange information and opinions. You said somebody got appointed today. What happened? Well, I don't know if they've been... Well, I don't, know, I don't know how long this person will be around, uh, but Biden's person to be the EPA transitional chief, at least, is someone who worked for DuPont and was responsible for... I think the name of the chemical was something like C8. It was a cancer-causing agent. It caused that big uh, out break of cancer in West Virginia that they made that recent movie about Darkwater. Yeah. Um, so, 
yeah, if you're thinking about someone you might put in charge of the EPA, it wouldn't be someone who has anything to do with that, I would think. But even Trump, I don't think the person he put in charge of the EPA is even that ghoulish. Although it's still somebody who's pretty ghoulish, but this this guy's probably the worst possible choice. Are you trying to tell me Jimmy Dore is right? Um, and when it comes to the Biden issue, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the one I heard is that uh, uh, Cedric Richmond's going to be involved in some way. He's my representative here in New Orleans. He sucks, by the way. He's terrible. Um, you know, I had to take care of him one time in the uh, restaurant. You know, he's a smooth guy, but whatever. I vote against him every time. He's an oil and gas guy, of course. Of um, course. Some people criticized that, and they said, like, how dare you criticize him? He's black. And I'm like, oh, this is what Katie Halper meant by weaponized wokeness. You know, as long as we got a transgender guy poisoning the waters, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> um, did I hear anything else, really, that was going on? Um, oh, of course, Nancy Pelosi's Speaker of the House again, which we all knew would happen. I mean, that's what we get for living in consequence-free America, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Anything else going on? Let's see. That's all I've heard in terms of appointments right now. I mean, I know that there's still a lot of names in the air, none of which sound particularly good. Uh, Pete Buttigieg is being considered for the VA. I heard about that, yeah. Um, how, how many, how do you think those, uh, those neocon never Trump Abraham Lincoln types are going to get a lot of positions of power or not really? I don't know. I know if they're lobbying hard for them, I guess we'll find out. Yeah, that's great, man. Nothing like getting some Iraq war boosters back in foreign policy, right? Not that they ever left. I mean... Yeah, well, they, they hadn't really been in the inner sanctum of power for a while because, you know, Obama rejected them. Trump rejected most of them, too. I mean, he, he, he had Bolton in there for a little while, but I think he might have only had him in there so he could laugh at this mustache. Um. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, the thing is, when I hear people talk about how Trump was clearly anti-intervention, that makes me wonder, do you think that he's just a complete moron because the people he keeps appointing are all people who are not of his viewpoint. I mean, if he's trying to accomplish the goal of getting out of the Middle East, you don't appoint people who are really into intervention. Oh, I know. That whole Bolton appointment, I was like, this is one of the dumber moves Trump has made and a long list of dumb moves. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting you bring that up. Yeah, yeah. No, but um, I don't know. I think he has his anti-intervention instincts, but... It doesn't mean he ratcheted down. I mean, he did ratchet some things down, right? But, I mean, he's hardly a peace candidate. But it's kind of like our bar is really low, right? So we're like, your foreign policy, it's like, oh, we'll give you extra marks for not blundering into a stupid war because we, our bar's low. Sure. Or like, or like somebody told me, like, Obama was great because at least the, like, the government ran well. And I'm like, you know what? You don't get a medal for flushing the toilet, Okay. You just don't. You don't get medals for that. So anyway, that's just a thought that I had on that one. Uh, but no, man, the Biden administration's uh, shaping up to be, uh, you know, woke capital uh, made flesh. It's gonna be. Uh, it's gonna be a gay old time. I did hear that. Um, what's what's his name? Um, uh, the guy who's like involved in um, some kind of like UN media project. Is one of these guys who's like our definition of the First Amendment is way too broad. So I think there's going to be a push for some kind of hate speech statutes or laws. I'm I'm not sure how they'll be able to implement that, you know. But I'm not surprised that that would be a top priority for them. That sounds fun. Hey, you know that way, like if uh, a lefty rises up, you can always accuse them of anti-Semitism, like they did to Jeremy Corbyn, right? And that they did to Bernie Sanders. All right, well, not really, but... They didn't do anti-Semitism. 
Yeah, I guess that's the yeah, one they yeah. forgot to do. <laughs> well, yeah, well they, I mean, he's a Jewish guy, although he barely talks about it. Apparently, Hillary, Hillary Clinton flirted with that well, See, the idea. thing was, um, Andrew Yang and Tulsi Gabbard, neither of whom are white BT dubs, were both accused of being white nationalists at one point. Yeah, funny how that's funny how that works, right? I mean, uh, you know, you 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 really need to hear voices from minority people unless those voices disagree with you, right? Yeah, um, but I mean, that's that's another reason why uh, that tipped me off that Vosh might be full of shit because he was one of the people repeating that for both of those people, huh? I don't know for both, but definitely for Tulsi. Of course, Tulsi Gabbard's interesting. Uh, she was one of the most despised candidates on the stage, like absolutely reviled. Most Democrats don't like her. The ones who do like her, of course, really like her. Yes. Like, uh, uh, but of, co- of course, Vash yeah. would say that. Of course, Vash would say that. He's a coward with no original thoughts. I remember he yeah. also condescendingly explained to some caller one time that uh, if you if you think you can't be a white nationalist just because you're not white, then you don't understand the issue. I'm like, dude, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard anybody say. I mean, yeah, I mean, I know some people like him. I know YouTube pushes him hard. I just wonder how, how is he? I mean, they're gonna what's gonna do? Like tie himself in knots over um, over Biden? I mean, when I was that kind of started happening with Biden's Obama. Elected, we can be critical of him again. Although Aaron Brockovich got in trouble on Twitter for. Uh, posting something about how this EPA appointment is a disaster and a betrayal, and there were people on Twitter who said, "Now's not the time for this. Come on, Aaron, you got to be better." I mean, I guess some people are going to attack you for anything, right? But there was a guy. They were. Um, I heard that uh, one of the guys at, Tra- uh, at Chapo Trap House. I think it was uh, Chrisman or something. I don't. I, I don't want to miss say his name, but. Uh, was saying that he thought that the whole, like, you can't attack Biden until he's elected is going to go out the window. Like, they're going to try to make it to the, no, no, don't attack him at all. Well, yeah, of course. Right? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, I mean, so do you think the vouchers of the world are going to be able to criticize Biden freely or even honestly, or are they just going to be shilling? Because, dude, I think they'll be shilling, man, because I saw that shit with Obama. People who are really critical of Bush... We're making a ton of excuses for Obama in those first few months, you know, when you know when they're realizing that oh, he's not the savior we thought he was, especially when Guantanamo wasn't shut down, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we just got just got to see what happens with Biden. It'll be interesting, you know. Um, I I wonder if Tim Dillon's right that you know it's all over and everybody's just going to want to chill out. And you know, have a beer and calm down. Or if uh, academic agents right, we're all just gonna start watching Fresh Prince of Bel Air again. <laughs> you know, I mean, how many, how many, how many people can you recruit for a protest when uh, you know the 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 Cheeto Hitler is not in there? <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm interested. That's all. Just curious, to see what happens. I can't wait. It's gonna be a weird presidency. Yeah. So, uh, you got you what? You got any ideas on what you might want to do uh, next week? I don't yet. <laughs> um, what about you? Um, do you want to do uh, go back to something uh, military again? You want to you want to really be dorks? We could talk about tanks of World War II, and then people can leave comments about how we get the specs wrong. It's like, come on, that armor was not. 13 centimeters thick, it was only 12.5. If you don't understand that, I can't take you seriously. Okay? I can't either, man. There's no way that uh, that tank could take on that tank. No. No way. Under no No. circumstances. None at all. But, uh, (laughs) or, you know, if you think that a wood, a spear was made out of oak rather than ash, then how can anyone ever take anything that you say seriously ever again? (laughs) How can you not be an expert on the types of wood? You bastard. (laughs) Um, Goodman4 has a super chat. He says, that modern F up American life, guys. 
Yeah. Thank you, Goodman, for... I don't know what that means exactly, but thank you. If you mean that's fucked up over here, then, well, yeah. Yeah, you... you fucked up for correct. a while. You're not wrong. <laughs> that, sir, you, you are you are definitely correct. <laughs> yes. Uh, things are a little fucky. I guess another yeah. option is um, we could do a roundup of some of the World War II generals, some of the people we left out of the original list, and just do... I don't know, maybe eight or so of them in a tier ranking. That's a good idea. I know eventually when we want to do a Soviet leader's tier ranking, right? I mean, yeah. there are only so many of them, so it wouldn't be exactly... It wouldn't be like those tier rankings we have where it's filled with faces, but yeah, I could do uh, uh, some uh, some other World War II commanders. You got anybody in mind that you really wanted to discuss? Um, for the British, Wilson is one we missed. He mostly was active in the Eastern Mediterranean, and he was kind of a go-to guy. I think he also did the invasion of Greece, maybe. Um, and I think look, he did, yeah. Yeah, so he's fairly important. Um, for the Germans, von Arnhem. I mean, you've recently read up on him, and I've got some stuff on him. He also, as you said, was the second highest-ranking German prisoner for a while for the Western Allies, so pretty big deal. Um, who else could we cover? Uh, Budeni for the Soviets. And also yes, Kirpanos. definitely, definitely Budini, definitely Budini. Yeah, Budini and Kurpanos, the guy who got encircled at Kiev and executed. Um, let's see, are there any other? I've got a f- Germans. Uh, you can talk about uh, Blasko Blaskovitz. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. He was. There's a lot of debates about him and his position within the uh, German military and his relationship with Hitler, if you will. There's also Witzblin. Witzbl- I'm butchering his name. I'm sorry, guys. It's a bit late over here. It's been a long weekend. Did a lot of work. That's why the Turtles video is not out. I One of our tour guides quit, and I had to work a lot this weekend. Um, but that is coming very soon, like within the next one to two days. All right? And also, after we get off here, I'll need you to stay a little bit because I want to try to do a screen share to make sure it works. Gotcha, gotcha, man. Yeah, good, good idea, good idea. Now, um, there was one of these guys who was really involved in the bomb plot, and he was in command of the troops in France while they were invading uh, Russia. So he'd be interesting one to talk about for sure. Um, we could also, you know, you know, it's one thing we should probably do also. Um, some things about the Allied ad- admirals in the Pacific, because we, I mean, I'm sorry, in the Atlantic, because we're, we're, we weren't able to talk about guys like Lutgens or Raider or anybody like that, because we, we didn't really do the naval stuff, the naval commanders at least. So some of the naval commanders, for sure. There's one or two Japanese admirals uh, that I had to cut that I'd like to discuss. Okay. And I guess also for the Americans, I don't think we did Patch or Hodges, did we? We did not. It'd be very good to talk about Hodges. Uh, definitely talk about Patch as well. Yeah, those would be two good ones. Um, there's another British guy. I can't think of his name right offhand, but he's all. I think was it Irons? Who's the guy who uh, led British troops into France initially with the BEF? Was that Gort or Ironside? I want to say Gort. I think it was Gort. Yeah, off the top of my head. I'll have to look in the Gort. What a fun yeah, no, we got it. Yeah, Gort. Great, great job. You gotta, gotta love having a last name like that. Huh? So I imagine Gort. when uh, the Germans learned about, oh, Gort is coming. What the fuck are the Mongols here? <laughs> so yeah, let's. Uh, why don't we do that one? Let's let's uh, let, let's finish up with some of those World War II commanders. Yeah, and you know, talk about a few a of those. Of, I don't know, eight to ten of them, and that should be enough for a Sunday show, I think. Yeah, that sounds good to me, man. That sounds like a good one. All right. Well, thank you for everybody who stuck around and listened to us talk about books. We will see you next week. We'll be doing a World War II roundup. And I think right now for the Turtles thing, we're tentatively thinking Tuesday, right? Or Monday or Tuesday. Uh, I'm going to lean towards Tuesday right now. I think Tuesday, but... I'm, I, I don't have any tours coming up for a while because Thanksgiving's around the corner. Um, so I think I'm going to be good for it. I'm probably Tuesday be the day. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And uh, somebody earlier asked a brief question about whether Caesar wrote 
the Gallic War commentary and the Civil War. He wrote all of the Gallic War except for the last book. He wrote half of the Civil Wars, but the last three books written by subordinates. Anyhow, okay. Do we know which? Do we know which subordinates? Uh, there are a lot of theories. Some are more convincing than others. Uh, probably Herdius wrote one of them, and I think one the last one in Spain might have been written by somebody who was actually fairly humble, a guy who might have just been a centurion. Uh, but we don't really oh, know for sure. But it's definitely much more of a soldier's perspective rather than a general slash politician. But Danny wants to do, uh, I'll mention that to him, Danny wants to do the Battle of Munda for one of the Forgotten Battles episodes next year. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. All right, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm ready to go ahead then. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming along. All right, well, we're going to go ahead on now to quote the great Joe Don Baker. <laughs> yes, the great Joe Don Baker. <laughs> All right, good night, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for the Super Chats. We will see you next week, or well, I guess even sooner with uh, the Turtles thing. So, peace out. All right, we are off the air. Hey, 